So I would like during this uh, session to provide a little bit of the perspective of uh, HexaX Work Package 4 that focuses on AI-driven communication and computation for design. And uh, yeah, uh, as Mik Miko presented me, uh, I'm, I'm Miltos Filippou. I work for Intel Germany and I have the honor to serve as a Work Package 4 lead of the project. So is this Work Package 4? about it's about ai driven communication and computation co-design there is a constellation of uh, partners as you can see across the board from the industry uh, academia also small and medium enterprises at the bottom you can see the timeline of the work package uh, we got started uh, last march in 2021 the first deliverable uh, was published in august on uh, gap analysis and i will get to that shortly and we have two more deliverables coming up uh, one in uh, at the end of June, practically in July, publicly available on initial solutions and the final deliverable on final solution proposals close to the end of the project. Uh, an overview of the uh, overall objectives of the work package for so uh, the aim is to or the overarching uh, objective is, is to develop concepts and solutions enabling AI driven communication and computation for design. So we th see things from multiple angles. So we got started by uh, uh, drafting down motivations for the application of AI ML mechanisms in the 5G and 6G systems. Uh, and then uh, we have two, I would say, blocks of uh, objectives. One that has to do with air interface uh, design, which is data centric. So designing wireless transceivers and air interface functionalities in a cost and complexity efficient manner. Uh, also data driven methods for uh, adaptivity to wireless environment uh, and uh, uh, resilience to changes in the, uh, in the uh, radio access network. Hardware impairment mitigation uh, is also something that we're very closely looking into as well as radio access flexibility and configurability. Then we have a number of objectives that look a little bit into the, another direction. So how to uh, uh, envision 6G as an intelligent and sustainable distributed platform, how to jointly optimize communication, computing and storage resources, no more looking into, uh, let's say, disjoint uh, and separated silos because uh, all these uh, resources, resources are, let's say, blended together and how uh, we can also take into account energy aware network elements because sustainability is one of the pillars of the project. Uh, more objectives have to do with federated learning communications and collaborative learning as a whole, guaranteeing accuracy and explainability of models, data integrity, security, privacy and trust, uh, explainability, interpretability. We're looking into these aspects as well. And also predictive management and orchestration, orchestration as a means of uh, providing AI functionality to the network for network operation. Uh, the uh, uh, work package con constitutes of uh, or comprises three tasks, one on gap analysis for AI driven communication and computation co-design because has been closed last August with the publication of the first deliverable. And there are two more tasks, one on AI driven air interface design. I would call it AI ML for better communications, whereas task 4.3 is looking on to let me allow uh, allow me to use the, the opposite direction that is communications for better AI. Uh, a little bit of a deeper dive, as deep as it can be given the uh, time that we have on D4.1 on the gap analysis. This has been pub published uh, in August and uh, the uh, mission and the scope was to gather all uh, different possible concepts where data centric techniques can be applied in in network uh, uh, learning and also for inferencing in uh, beyond 5G and 6G networks, uh, both looking into uh, the design of air interface functionalities and also uh, uh, utilizing and designing uh, the 6G network in a way such that it will be a powerful uh, and distributed platform for learning and inferencing. Uh, a, a glimpse uh, of the technical enablers that we're working on. We have two research areas on AI-driven air interface design. So uh, transceiver design, AI-driven transmitter design, receiver design, radio interface functionality, uh, uh, looking into uh, a little bit higher than the physical layer aspect. So uh, interference management, the radio resource allocation concepts. Whereas looking on the right-hand side, we're looking into uh, network learning methods and algorithms, uh, focusing on topics on joint communication, computation co-design, AI security, privacy, and trust, and AI powered 
network cooperation. Over the top, you can see some first identified requirements in the form of KPIs and KVIs for each one of the two research directions, and I will uh, get into that uh, in uh, quite more detail in the next couple of minutes. Regarding the AI-driven interface design, here is a, let's say, uh, uh, overview or 30,000 feet view of what, uh, how we are doing things in this task. So we start always from the identified 6G use cases, KPIs and KVIs, and then uh, we uh, focus on the design of certain functionalities uh, uh, and uh, introduce link level uh, enablers, such as relating to adaptive channel estimation, beam forming design, uh, uh, beam tracking, data driven channel coding, decoding, and hardware impairment compensation. And then we go up and take into account uh, system level, uh, level enablers such as interference management, resource allocation, link, uh, link adaptation, and mobility management. And of course, we also always take into account the uh, latest, let's say, trends and concepts uh, re referring to RIS technologies, cell free and device to device, and also cellular as usual. Uh, just uh, uh, flashing very quickly some or highlighting the topics that we have been working on in this first deliverable. So in terms of novel data-driven transceiver design approaches, uh, we uh, have identified gaps and we're working in the solution uh, space uh, on, on topics such as transceiver hardware impairments and looking at, into the transmitter side, beam forming design, beam management, multi-antenna signal transmission, multi-cell, multi-user MIMO. Uh, and then uh, on the opposite side, at the receiver side, there is a number uh, of topics or features of focus dealing with channel estimation and denoising, uh, uh, RIS assisted systems and how we can estimate channels there, low complexity channel estimation, uh, data driven channel coding for constraint devices, and uh, this so called end to end driven receiver design, which consists in the case where instead of optimizing uh, block by block uh, the, uh, the receiver, uh, the uh, aim is to design uh, the whole, uh, uh, let's say, uh, set of blocks, maybe even together with your transmitter as a single optimization problem, uh, replacing the classical uh, model-based approaches by, by, let's say, a large neural network or data-centric techniques as a whole. AI-driven radio interface functionality, again, a constellation of topics here, radio resource management based on latent variables, interference management in cell-free massive MIMO, radio resource allocation for cell-free massive MIMO, data importance aware radio resource management because we care, we do care about data economy and frugality. Data is going to be, it is actually a, a monetizable uh, 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 quantity to, to exchange among networks and among terminals. AI for distributed massive MIMO architectures and model predictive control for MIMO. Antenna systems, uh, just to uh, highlight that when, when we look in this task 4.2, uh, different topics, uh, the aim or the motivation for introducing data centric techniques is, I would say, largely twofold. The fact that uh, current solutions or model based or classical solutions uh, are maybe not so sustainable anymore because of the size of the optimization problems that have to be solved in dense deployment environments. And on the other hand, um, uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, uh, hardware impairment phenomena are highly nonlinear and quite hard to model. Also, the wireless channel uh, cannot be made it be adequately modeled in a way that we would like to do. So, having the measurements and data, and also synthetic data sets that the different partners are working on, uh, can contribute towards, um, uh, let's say, uh, raising this kind of uh, uh, deficiencies or limitations in model or classical based communications for the area interface design. Use cases. Uh, in this, uh, from this task perspective, uh, focus is on some indicative use cases, challenging. That's why we have selected them. So merged reality game and work, uh, interacting in cooperative mobile ro robots and flexible manufacturing. So uh, when it comes also to KPIs and KVIs from AI driven or interface design perspective here, uh, you can see that uh, we're dealing with uh, mainly two different sets of KPIs. So conventional communication KPIs, the usual suspects, such as latency, bit rate, spectral efficiency, uh, uh, energy efficiency, bandwidth, uh, outages, reliability, signaling overhead, bank, back hole, front hole capacity. But we're also introducing some KPIs which are uh, ML related and are, let's say, newcomers, such as what is the complexity gain to expect? What is the convergence speed to expect? 
what is the uh, flexibility of the solutions, the data quality, how much data do we want to use? Are all of these data measurements available at our, dispo at our disposal all the time or not? Mobility support and others. And also looking into the KVI areas, just a very quick view, generalizability, we want to generalize things because uh, we want to deal with very uh, volatile channel conditions uh, regarding the wireless channel trustworthiness, of course, of data, uh, service availability, resistance to adversarial attacks, deployment flexibility, and others. Now, switching gears uh, to the um, uh, 6G network being or having the ambition, ambition to be uh, an efficient, uh, meaning sustainable and trustworthy uh, distributed learning platform, Task 4.3 deals with these topics. So again, we take a, a bottom-up look into things so uh, we start with uh, the sustainability work. So how we can allocate, how we can uh, utilize the different communication and computation resources that we have available in the network as a whole. And there is a number of topics here. Uh, I would uh, indicatively refer to orchestration solutions for distributed AI, model convergence and multi-agent consensus. If you have multiple AI agents dispersed over a network, uh, then the uh, need for consensus and the need to uh, deal with learning strugglers is of paramount importance. Learning in the cloud and inferencing at the edge, how we can uh, deal with learning when it comes to Internet of Things and, and not very much powerful devices at the edge of the network. Uh, semantic communications going beyond Shannon. Uh, and then we're looking, going up, we're looking into the trustworthiness uh, perspective. So how we can enhance uh, the privacy for collaborative AI ML, how we can turn the AI functionality into an explainable, into, into a friend and not to a, a foe to, uh, to the end user and to the network manager, uh, federated explainable AI and how the network can be also resilient to adversarial attacks and data poisoning. So uh, uh, avoiding the case where attacks would uh, lead the system or the AI functionality towards one generalization and what not uh, towards, let's say, a sub subjective or an objective better generalization. And then going further up, sub AI powered network operation enablers such as management and orchestration uh, and uh, using AI and machine learning for network security enhancement. So uh, intrusion detection for, uh, for instance. This is very, uh, very important, the last one for uh, cybersecurity uh, related topics. Again, a big uh, pool of uh, topics to highlight here, not much time to uh, provide the deep dive, uh, but I would uh, highlight uh, a number of uh, enablers that partners have introduced. So uh, model convergence and consensus, we have talked about that distributed learning at the cloud and at the edge, how do we distribute the different uh, uh, resources in the cloud and at the edge orchestration, compute as a service. So how we can, uh, provide trustworthy and sustainable AI-based workload assignment. If a device, an end device is not very much powerful, how we can delegate the workload to the right, meaning the available, uh, the trustworthy, and the best performing uh, edge uh, uh, node, uh, which has the adequate resources in the network to undertake this workload. Of course, knowledge sharing and semantic and goal-oriented communications, no more dealing with the so far uh, which was the case and uh, absolutely uh, needed uh, uh, philosophy of uh, designing communication systems with the aim of um, enhancing, maximizing the reliability that is reducing the bit errors. But what is the message behind it we want to pass uh, to, to the receiver side? Enablers for in-network AI privacy, security and trust, privacy enhancing technologies for collaborative AI and ML, focus on federated learning more specifically. Uh, explainability, uh, we uh, are dealing with the, as you can see at the bottom right, um, there is a trade-off between accuracy and in interpretability of uh, AI and machine learn learning models. So the more complex it is, the hardest, the harder it is to explain in very simple words. Uh, but this is a challenge because the end user would like to understand the root cause. Why is a recommendation? Why a prediction is provided by uh, an AI entity? Because it says so or because it provides, us, it provides some, some sufficient ground for that. Network operation and architectural implications. I would uh, refer to uh, AI-based management and orchestration, uh, intrusion detection system architecture and detection procedures. Architecturally, and this is undergoing work, of course, 
uh, uh, hot topics have to do with how, uh, for example, we can discover AI agents, how we can select the right AI agent, and how we can pair uh, uh, an available AI service uh, to an inferencing task uh, in need uh, to, to, to the right learning algorithm and topology. You may need uh, a certain recommendation. You may need a certain prediction or classification, but the AI agent, which is right next to you and it is perfectly trained to do something, it does just something else. So maybe uh, the uh, right AI agent needs to be discovered in that case. Focused use cases, similar to task 4.2, would uh, have a high focus on uh, telepresents and uh, robots to cobots use case families, and we have identified some uh, 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 some indicative and challenging uh, use cases to address, uh, but we have quite some uh, sufficient tools, AI as a service, computer as a service, and AI assisted p 2 x And uh, moving on with KPIs and KVIs, similarly, we have uh, identified the number of metrics and requirements and also soft goals on top of the legacy networks such as explainability and fairness and data frugality and economy, model complexity from a KVI area. AI agent availability and reliability from a revolutionary or new KPI area, the usual but very important KPIs in terms of latency and traffic capacity and protection density, and new capability areas uh, dealing with AI agent density, network energy efficiency, latency, and interpretability level. Uh, a very quick glimpse of what we're working right now in V4.2. This is work in progress, and the uh, deliverable is going to be out and published in July, this July. Uh, we are, uh, of course, extending the work and the technical enablers that we have identified and gaps in D4.1, and we have categorized them into four areas overall. So one area has to do with network performance enhancement using AI, ML, and 6D, uh, dealing with radio access network performance improvements over classical design methods, as expected, and improving improvements in end-to-end -end network operation and management. Second big area has to do with 6G network as an efficient AI platform. So here's where the joint communication, computation, code design, and resource allocation work uh, has been categorized uh, on AI governance, uh, scalable solutions for multi-AI uh, agent learning, how we can deal with strugglers, how uh, the AI architecture and the learning system can scale. Computation and compute resource allocation, compute as a service, energy efficiency is always at the spotlight knowledge-based workload migration and uh, channel charting. Two more areas have to do with AI ML as an enabler for 6G network sustainability, frugal AI, semantics, energy efficiency network, AI ML, and of course, complexity reduction gains. We would like uh, the AI, the, the 6G system and devices and the, the whole network as a whole to, uh, uh, to excel in terms of performance, but uh, uh, also we deal a lot and we should care a lot about the uh, incurring uh, uh, complexity and cost of the, of the new devices to expect. Privacy, security, and trust. Security and privacy mechanisms for collaborative learning and explainable AI. We extend the work and already we have uh, results to, that we're working on. Uh, just a few seconds on, uh, uh, on, on the demonstration activities that are undergoing. There is a demo, proof of concept, dealing with work package four and also work package five work that has to do with federated explainable AI. Uh, the uh, aim here is to, uh, uh, to, to uh, develop a framework for federated learning of explainable AI models along with the related signaling using a real-time network emulator, namely CIMU 5G tool, which has been developed by University of Pisa. And uh, we have already defined the scenario which consists of multiple UEs, and automotive application scenarios under consideration. So data is provided in the form of quality of service and quality of ex experience values. And the, uh, uh, the task uh, has to do with the uh, prediction of quality of experience in the very near future. Uh, uh, on their way, and it, should be, it will be delivered by the end of the project as planned. Here are some uh, conclusion bullet points before I, uh, I stop here. So we have, uh, I have hopefully walked you through the 6G use cases from an AI ML interest perspective and looking into two different directions, AI based or interface design and um, a communication system design and resource, holistic resource allocation for more efficient and better AI. Work is ongoing, the demo work is ongoing, uh, D4.2 will be out soon. And just to highlight last but not the least that uh, we have two accepted workshops 
uh, and we would very kindly invite everyone to provide contributions. One is the first international workshop on AI and beyond 5G and 6G wireless networks as part of the IEEE 2022 World Congress on Computational Intelligence in Padua, Italy this July. Uh, submission deadline is this uh, March uh, 7, so it's upcoming in a month from now. And also another one on ML and AI for communications, uh, more focused on the air interface design as part of the IEEE VTC 2022 Spring Conference uh, submission paper deadline by 20, February 20, uh, 24th, so in about three weeks from now. That should be it. I made it in exactly 20 minutes. So back to you, Miko. I can, of course, uh, we can in Work Package for always available for questions and collaboration with the other ICT 52 projects offline. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Miltos. Uh, uh, so uh, great to start with this. And uh, in the interest of uh, time, uh, for the time between the presentations, um, I, I propose that there is also no immediate question in the chat. Uh, I would propose that we move forward and uh, please pay attention also from your side to the chat uh, uh, if there is uh, is any additional uh, question there. And uh, so, so I would then propose that we move forward uh, with uh, uh, second Hexa X uh, presentation on similar things uh, from uh, higher layers. Uh, so mainly then from the work package uh, six uh, lead point of view. So Ignacio, floor is uh, yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Miko. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Can hear you and can see the slides and you well. OK, perfect. Thank you very much, Miko. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Ignacio Labrador. I'm here representing World Packet 6 from XIX. Well, just a brief introduction. In, in World Packet 6, uh, we have already published our first uh, deliverable past June, focusing on the gap analysis for the uh, Beyond 5G, 6G uh, service management and orchestration and identifying the main enablers and, and features. But now our main activities are focused on the second deliverable, deliverable 6.2, which is intended uh, to describe the management and orchestration architectural design um, uh, based on, on, on the findings in the previous deliverable, 6.1, and uh, um, that is planned to be released uh, next April. So in this presentation, I'm going to introduce the work uh, we are doing regarding this architectural design. Uh, these are the contents of, of the presentation. As you see, we are focusing on the management and orchestration architectural design. Um, uh, not sure if we will have time to cover all topics. If not, uh, you can take a look to the presentation and send me your comments or questions offline using the chat or my email address in the previous slide. Okay. Okay. This is our overall architectural design. Uh, it's still work in progress but the final versions will not be uh, very different to what we have uh, on the screen now. Um, before going into details, I just want to mention uh, this has been elaborated based on the 5G architectural view from the 5G PPP architecture working group that we have on the screen now. I mean, uh, what we present here is uh, basically an evolution uh, based on this view that we in NextX uh, consider our benchmark or baseline. Uh, as we see uh, in this view, the 5G PPP working group uh, distinguishes the three different domains, the service domain, network domain, and the infrastructure domain uh, with different components and processes on each one. Uh, we basically follow the same approach in our XX architecture. Uh, as you can see, this is our architecture again. Uh, we have uh, highlighted uh, some features that we consider the most uh, relevant for the next uh, beyond 5G and 6G networks. I will introduce uh, some of them uh, through the, uh, the presentation. As you see, we have uh, clearly separated uh, the management and orchestration scope uh, because uh, management and orchestration is our main uh, interest in World Packet 6. So on the left hand side, we have the, the managed objects, uh, this uh, red uh, line we have in the, in the figure. Uh, that means the, the network services, for example, the network slices and the different sets of network functions uh, that can be managed. While on the right hand side, we have the, the managing objects. 
uh, those objects uh, actually in charge of managing the, the managed objects. The general uh, design criteria is this is a cloud native uh, software uh, service based uh, management architecture. Uh, that means uh, the basic building blocks for implementing network functions and services will be softwareized, uh, self contained, independent, and reusable uh, components uh, from different sources and suppliers. Of course, uh, this is something already introduced in 5G, for instance, by using virtualization techniques and DNFs. But our proposal here is to focus on uh, more lightweight uh, components uh, for, in, uh, for the implementation, for, for example, uh, based on containers. And also to generalize the usage of uh, these components for implementing all network functions in the network domain. Uh, for instance, the radio access uh, network functions, the core network functions, and of course, the management and orchestration functions as well. Regarding the management and orchestration scope, uh, the core part are the management and orchestration functions themselves, of course, which can be instantiated in the different domains, the service domain, network domains, and the infrastructure domains. So those are the, the great blocks we have here in the, in the figure. The management and orchestration functions are those uh, dealing with uh, provisioning, assurance, uh, performance management, call management, uh, energy saving management, or intent control, among others. As we see, uh, those basic management and orchestration functions uh, will be supported by other set of functions, uh, monitoring functions, artificial intelligence and machine learning functions, and security functions. The idea here is that uh, all those functions together can uh, be used to implement uh, the different control loops at the different domains, uh, as we have uh, here in the figure. As we were mentioning, uh, one of the main enablers uh, is the application of the cloud native principles. But um, as we know, this is not only about uh, using containers. We, we know cloud native is more than that, or should be more than that. So we have introduced uh, this uh, design domain part of the management and orchestration architecture. This is because uh, cloud native uh, means also to facilitate uh, the way uh, services are deployed and updated. Uh, it also means to be able to put together uh, or very close uh, development and operational teams by using DevOps uh, practices and implementing continuous integration or continuous uh, delivery pipelines uh, among others. And it also means to do this uh, with a very high automation degree using uh, DevOps or even AI ops uh, techniques. This is, of course, uh, challenging in a self-co-grade environment uh, where multiple vendors are typically involved for developing network services. But uh, this is why we consider this should be part of the management and orchestration architecture. Another important feature uh, is what the NXIX we call Continuum Device Edge Cloud Management and Orchestration. We don't have uh, much time here, but in short, uh, this is about uh, breaking silos uh, and expanding the network uh, beyond the mobile network operator domain, including other networks, but also uh, beyond the edge network, including uh, end user devices uh, beyond the access network. We consider this is one of the main innovations and challenges uh, regarding management and orchestration in XIX because it implies to integrate the extreme edge uh, domain. This uh, extreme edge uh, is very different to the core network or even the regular edge, uh, which are located in a strictly controlled uh, data centers or installations. The theme uh, refers to uh, those de devices uh, at the end user domain. Uh, so we are talking about uh, a high heterogeneity of devices, volatile resources with random behavior. The devices can be switched on or off unexpectedly. So we have we have um, um, asynchronous uh, behaviors. We have an asynchronous environment. We have a diversity of supporting technologies, uh, a massive in scale ecosystem that can exist, uh, exceed uh, human scale uh, regarding operations. We have devices uh, with uh, sometimes with very limited uh, computing and storage resources. Uh, so uh, uh, we consider this is a big challenge, uh, but also a, a big opportunity for innovation. 
this is uh, why we have in our architecture this uh, infrastructure uh, domain control loops, uh, which uh, should be specifically designed to manage uh, the infrastructure discovery, considering this asynchronicity I was mentioning before. And of course, uh, for implementing the associated uh, monitoring function. Another important uh, feature in our architecture is uh, data driven orchestration, uh, which, uh, as we see in the figure, uh, relies on two sets of uh, functions monitoring functions and uh, also artificial intelligence and machine learning functions. Also, on the deployment of uh, collaborative uh, AI components across the network, as uh, Miltos was mentioning in the, in the previous presentation regarding work, work Packets 4, um, these, funs, these functions together are expected to work in a close uh, relationship uh, to trigger uh, orchestration actions. Monitoring functions are, of course, not new. Uh, they get data that may be relevant for triggering orchestration actions. But perhaps the main innovation regarding this uh, here is about uh, data sources that uh, should consider not only infrastructure data, but also uh, user plane data. Artificial intelligence uh, uh, and machine learning functions are used uh, to deal uh, with uh, data complexity. Um, I have uh, this specific uh, slide regarding artificial intelligence. Um, yeah, this is about uh, ma managing complexity, but uh, where is complexity regarding uh, management and orchestration? We have identified uh, three main areas where artificial intelligence and machine learning can support uh, management and orchestration processes. One of them is time series processing. Uh, we know the metrics that can be obtained from the different network elements can be seen uh, as time series. And this makes it possible to correlate heterogeneous data and make predictions uh, based on that, which can be used to trigger orchestration actions, for instance, uh, place, placement actions or uh, scaling actions. Also, artificial intelligence on, or machine learning can be used to support uh, the extreme edge integration I was commenting before. For instance, artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used to implement uh, big data analytics techniques to process a big amount of data coming from the diverse extreme edge devices and also to trigger orchestration actions uh, based on that. Finally, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can be also used uh, for the operations management itself. Uh, this is what uh, is commonly referred as AI ops. It has to do with uh, automating and improving activities in the, in the operations teams. A relevant example, which is one of the main points of interest for our work in XIX, is intent-based networking. This is especially oriented to non-skilled vertical users to allow them to deploy or configure their services by simply declaring high-level intentions and preventing them from having to deal with more complicated low-level configuration details. Artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used here to translate those high level intent uh, declarations into the corresponding low level orchestration actions. In the slide, uh, you can see also other ways uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used uh, regarding operation, such as uh, alarms filtering or artificial intelligence driven root cause uh, analysis for analyzing incidents, uh, among others. Okay, together with uh, artificial intelligence, automation is also another relevant feature. Um, as we have seen in the figure in our architectural design, we have the different sets of uh, control loops to automate processes in each of the different domains. I have been mentioning before the infrastructure domain control loop uh, regarding the, the integration of the extreme edge infrastructure for the infrastructure discovery and for the monitoring. But in general, this is for all the, uh, for all the components in, in the infrastructure domain. I was also mentioning the DevOps uh, control loop for integrating the design domain regarding the continuous uh, integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous monitoring, and uh, all the activities uh, related to, to that. But we also have the service domain control loop uh, specialized for the service domain and the network domain control loop. The service domain control loop um, it is, of course, related to the service uh, 
management, service creation and operation, service assurance, uh, fulfillment control loops, uh, the intent-based service management I was mentioning before, service quality management processes, among others. The network domain control loop, uh, we have the network functions like, like uh, cycle management, trend monitoring, of course, uh, and associated to that, the artificial intelligence and machine learning orchestration actions, and also the security uh, policies. Regarding security, um, besides automation in the XIX management and orchestration architecture, uh, we want to consider security from the beginning. Um, to expand the network uh, towards the extreme edge and other networks, uh, for example, non-public networks or hyper scalars, uh, could bring new challenges uh, regarding security. So we want to consider security from the beginning. This is why we have these orange uh, blocks in, in our architectural design. This, uh, this security uh, management and orchestration blocks, uh, we consider them as a specialized uh, subsystem of the overall uh, management and orchestration system. It is basically composed of uh, both security management functions and the security enablers, and it also leverages on artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques uh, for prediction and decision making. As we have seen, uh, we have different network elements in different network domains, uh, and we need to communicate uh, those elements. Uh, for, so for communicating uh, these elements, we, we propose this API management exposure block that uh, we saw in our architectural design. This mechanism uh, follows the service-based management architecture pattern. It basically enables uh, the different management and orchestration functions to expose their services through a number of uh, programmable interfaces, which can be invoked from other entities. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to read what we have in the slide, but the general idea is to make the management and orchestration components to be able to, com to communicate each other with different uh, granularity levels, but following a unified pattern that can be regulated using control access policies. The standards. Well, you probably have noticed I didn't refer uh, explicitly um, any standard while I was describing the previous slides. This is because um, uh, in XIX, uh, the, the, this management and orchestration architectural design uh, does not explicitly align with a specific standard. Our, um, our target is to provide a um, framework as track enough to make possible implementations, different implementations that could be aligned with uh, a variety with different state-of-the-art standards and also possible future standards. Uh, our target is to provide uh, this generic management of an orchestration architectural design not explicitly aligned with a specific standard. The reason for this is you have it here in the slide. We have a high diversity of uh, standard development organizations and uh, providing standards and also uh, de facto standards approaching different architectural designs. We have some of them here on the screen. But in XX, okay, this is a flagship uh, project um, and we need to think long term. Uh, so which standards will be in use in, in 10 years from now? We don't know, that's a long way to go. So we don't want to, to set aside the standards that could be relevant in the mid term or in the long term. And we don't want to make uh, the management and orchestration architect architectural design prematurely obsolete. So our approach is to provide a um, generic framework able to align with different standards. So this is uh, the challenge for us. Of course, we are working on standards in, in World Packet 6. Uh, in fact, we are working a lot on, on that. We dedicated a lot of time to that. And we'll provide practical alignment exercises on different state-of-the-art standards uh, that will be shown in, in, in the different uh, World Packet 6 uh, demos. And also, we'll study possible contributions to a standard development organizations uh, based on the outcome from that. Okay, this is my last slide. As, as I was commenting at the beginning, um, 
this architecture will be uh, described in the in, in detail in our next deliverable, deliverable sector two. This is a public deliverable. Uh, it's currently in progress. We are working hard now uh, to, to produce this deliverable. And the description will provide these three views uh, we have on the screen uh, now, the structural view, the functional view, and the deployment view. The structural view is uh, describing uh, the main building blocks. This is basically what I have been presenting in the previous slide. The functional view will be focusing on behaviors and processes. Uh, all these things about intent-based networking, uh, how to use artificial intelligence, um, uh, all the all all the processes that uh, can be uh, implemented using the main building blocks in the structural view, they will be described here. And finally, we will also provide a deployment view indicating how this uh, cloud native architecture, cloud native manage, management architecture, architecture could be deployed in practice. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much uh, for attending. I don't know if you have. Questions or comments? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Ed. you. And uh, and, uh, uh, in a bit in the bit interest bit of bit time, bit we maybe need to bit move bit forward already to next uh, next presentation. Uh, but uh, please uh, pay attention to the uh, chat uh, for potential additional uh, questions. So. Next would be time for project uh, Dedicat 6 c on data marketplace for access control, asset sharing and privacy preserving AI ML by George uh, Saleh. Uh, so, George, please, the floor is uh, yours. Okay, I will offline be in connection with uh, Joe to find out uh, uh, about uh, the availability for a later presentation today. Uh, but as uh, George is actually not uh, for some reason in the in the meeting, I would uh, propose then that we move to AI at Edge project, bringing AI to the Edge uh, by Christina Costa. So, Christina, uh, could you start uh, sharing your presentation? Okay, uh, just one minute. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Cristina Costa. Um, so and sorry, I Christina, the presentation that uh, we can now see is in the presenter mode. So, uh, established if you could make it uh, full screen. Uh, you might have two screens, and if possible, fastest way to solve this would be if you share your your own screen with that uh, slide in the full presentation mode. Ah, okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. It's a full screen. But but. Uh, uh, the presentation slide might be full screen, but you are just sharing a application and not the screen. So because you are sharing a, a, an okay. application and you have uh, two screens, then it's uh, showing the screen where it's in the mode for the presenter to be seen. So it's if you okay, yes, now now it's uh, great. Uh, so okay. so uh, now you can be seen, heard, and s slides are fine. So thank you. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I was saying, uh, my name is Cristina Costa. I'm from FBK, Italy, and I'm present here um, to present um, the work that we are doing on uh, the project AI at Ed. And, and also the for uh, with uh, the people for um, work package leader. Um, our um, project uh, involves uh, 19 partners for a, from eight uh, European countries, 
uh, has a duration of 36 months and is now in the in the end of uh, his its uh, first uh, first year. Uh, it has um, the main objectives of uh, this project are uh, related or or connected and uh, related uh, to um, the uh, bring to bringing the uh, intelligence. Uh, uh, to the edge, the, in the, the artificial intelligence to the edge. Uh, it, um, it aims at uh, bringing a distributed uh, a AI ML methods into the edge, uh, leveraging on uh, connect compute, uh, connect compute capabilities of the infrastructure, and mixing also both uh, cloud computing and uh, 5G concepts uh, with uh, reusable, uh, secure and privacy preserving uh, AI ML layer. Uh, it also provides a network automation platform to support uh, at, uh, AI enabled cloud native applications. And that have also the objective uh, of um, introducing uh, um, a new concept uh, related to AI enabled applications uh, that leverage on the concept of artificial intelligence uh, functions and uh, their chaining. And also have the objective of validating all these concepts through um, impact uh, use cases. Uh, even if uh, we um, say that we are um, bringing to the edge, I actually we consider all the edge cloud continuum, so far edge, near edge cloud, and um, we start from the, 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 the very starting point that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the concept uh, of um, bringing uh, the, 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 the applications and the AI uh, where uh, the, the, the user is and where the data is, um, is produced is uh, automatically uh, convenient. Uh, this architecture uh, minimizes uh, the latency associated with uh, decision making uh, real time applications, reduces the connectivity cost uh, because you send information that matters on the clou uh, cloud only when it's needed, uh, improves security uh, because uh, you can keep uh, um, sensitive data closer to its source and enables autonomous operation in event of uh, connectivity lost. Um, brings uh, uh, AI at edge to this um, to this uh, framework. Uh, first of all, we bring up this. Uh, uh, we leverage on this concept that we are introducing. That is uh, the AIFs. AIFs are um, linked to the concept of AI and applications that can be uh, created by chaining uh, multiple AIFs uh, and the AIF uh, capture, uh, captures um, the, uh, all the information, minimal inform uh, minimal computational um, block in which we can uh, divide uh, the AI enabled application. Its conceptual model captures and represents uh, in general terms uh, some common aspects that you can find uh, in different uh, AI and uh, AIS. And the idea is that uh, the ML task can be decomposed uh, across uh, the var various uh, geographical places in, uh, in the cloud. In order to have a components that can also be reusable, uh, on on the right we, we can see this uh, conceptual model that implies having um, interfaces that are well defined for exchanging data, exchanging model, uh, and providing results, uh, user results to, to to the user application. Uh, as uh, I say, um, we, the, the, the application can be represented then for, uh, with a graph, a graph, 
That is then uh, orchestrated around uh, all of the all the cloud co cloud continuum. Uh, in our project, we consider um, various types of uh, of AIFs from um, network of formation AIFs. That is are the one that in which we can leverage uh, to uh, manage the complexity of uh, of a new generation networks. Then application related AIFs that are the ones that are runs on top uh, of, uh, of, of the framework, and also supporting AIFs uh, that support uh, pipeline, uh, like data filtering, data consolidation, uh, uh, federated learning uh, agents, uh, and global model builders. So, they are, uh, they can, uh, we consider that uh, each uh, of these uh, blocks have um, different uh, capabilities and but also different requirements both in terms of computation but also uh, especially in terms of uh, latency we have uh, latency critical AAFs, low latency and latency intolerant AAS and they form uh, that can form uh, different types of uh, closed loop that are uh, spread uh, across the different uh, uh, compute nodes uh, that uh, are in the continuum. Uh, the requirements of, uh, of, a, of this AIF may change in, to, in, in time, and also the capabilities of the network may change. This means that uh, we should leverage on um, should leverage on dynamic orchestration for migrating and scaling the AIFs, and this also should go through different uh, slices in the network, uh, slices that represent different uh, uh, use cases uh, uh, requirements. Uh, uh, how we do that? We do it uh, uh, through uh, six main breakthroughs uh, that are uh, AAL uh, ML uh, for closed loop automation, privacy, privacy preserving machine learning for multi stakeholder environments, distributed and uh, decentralized uh, connect compute platform, the provisioning of uh, AI enabled applications hardware accelerated serverless platform for AI ML, and closed layer multi-connectivity and disaggregated radio access. As you see here, you have uh, both uh, uh, components uh, that uh, are um, AI for networks. So, um, AI is used for supporting uh, the, the operation of a network and its automation toward the zero such networks. And also, uh, on the older way around, we have uh, the networks that are uh, supporting the AI. For doing this, uh, we have built, we are building actually, um, a network and service automation platform that uh, is, um, has uh, the, the vision of uh, all that uh, all the all of the continuum and uh, is composed by different um, blocks um, a multi-tier orchestrator uh, some intelligent uh, component a real a real time brick uh, for um, access automation and a slice manager for uh, working on the of, for optimizing the slices for the different uh, verticals. All this uh, work together for um, for automating uh, the, the network uh, and the compute and and uh, computer capabilities. Underneath this, we have uh, the AI Edge Connect Compute Platform. That is a distributed platform that is uh, supports uh, the uh, orchestration of the ADFs all, all through the network. 
Uh, we have um, this, uh, these two, um, this two component uh, have been described in uh, uh, our uh, recently released uh, deliverables that you can find in our site. So uh, the enable end-to-end uh, -end application subcomponents can then be deployed across uh, the converged uh, IH con net compute platform. So the NSAP then um, is able uh, to uh, distribute uh, training and inference tasks across the various connect compute uh, nodes and operates uh, three types of uh, closed loop automation. Uh, the first one is the resource uh, control loop that is local uh, to each node and uh, controls, uh, the, uh, controls the resources that are consumed in an optimal way. Then we have an SAP control loop that uh, uh, has, um, uh, works at the uh, NSAP level, so at the automation level. And then you have uh, a cross-domain control loop that is able uh, to, to communicate also with the uh, NSAP control loop, a resource control loop, and give an input to them in order that they can uh, adapt their control loops for better optimization. And we have the um, Connect Compute platform that um, is uh, built to leverage on the HCMAC architecture and provisions AI-enabled AI applications. It leverages on um, three uh, main uh, um, characteristics. Uh, one is technologies, one is uh, serverless function integration, then it provides also hardware accelerator uh, platform for AI ML, and also cross-layer multi-connectivity uh, disaggregator uh, radio access at the asset site in order to provide a better uh, uh, connection. We have uh, recently uh, we have, um, defined a, a more detailed architecture here that uh, comprises also of, uh, the data collection uh, pipeline uh, and uh, specify uh, so the different uh, levels of, uh, of a framework. We consider a distributed uh, architecture where we have a different MAC systems that uh, can are connected between them, between the uh, MAC orchestrator. And uh, you, we also leverage on the disaggregated run uh, for um, advanced services like uh, MTCP, uh, MTCP uh, connectivity and for gathering also metrics for improving and uh, for improving applications uh, and automation. Um, also, this uh, the architecture is defined in better detail uh, in uh, the deliverable uh, uh, 2.1 and 2.2. That, um, and uh, finally, we have um, defined four work case, uh, for um, use cases for the validation of uh, our uh, our breakthroughs and on three verticals of uh, great impact. The first one is automotive with a validation of uh, vehicle cooperative perception with uh, cooperative perception uh, AIS based on cooperative AI, uh, an industrial IoT uh, vertical for secure and resilient orchestration of large networks uh, where it, that uh, supports anomaly and intrusion detection AIS, uh, one vertical on, on uh, drones uh, for AJ. AI assisted monitoring of linear infrastructure using drones, uh, where uh, we uh, use, uh, we, we validate it with uh, the, the deployment of detection and localization AAFs. And finally, the content curator, curation uh, 
um, vertical. Uh, whereas smart content and data curation for in-flight and entertainment services uh, are deployed. Uh, and uh, so also with uh, its uh, related uh, AAF. Um, also these uh, use cases are better defined than the new world 5.1. And uh, so summarizing. Um, uh, AI, uh, AI attach. We have uh, um, had a, a quick view of uh, the domain of uh, of work and research of AI attach that is uh, focusing on reusable, uh, secure, and privacy-aware AI ML models uh, that provides a layer of automa automation um, platform for zero touch management of network and services. A AI enable application uh, as a composition of AIS, AIFs, and uh, high impact industry relevant, relevant use cases. So I would like to thank you for your attention and um, invite you to, 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 to check our social, uh, social network subscribe to our newsletters and check out uh, our first technical deliverables on the website. Uh, the first is already there and the other ones will be available soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Christina. You. Uh, great uh, presentation and uh, any immediate uh, questions? There is uh, in the chat, uh, there is a question to you. Uh, how does the functionality prerequisites of the security and privacy preserving AI ML layer change uh, slash depend on near slash far edge or cloud? Um, we are uh, um, our um, in our um, infrastructure. We um, we host uh, security, uh, secure AI, AI functions for um, for um, improving the, the 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 automation layer. So it's more uh, um, something on top of it. Um, Maybe maybe the discussion can continue in the chat. Uh, so uh, yeah, very pleasant to have uh, these uh, excellent uh, presentations in the beginning of the session. Expecting this to continue. So as uh, next uh, we have then a presentation on AI at six C from uh, by, by Dan Warren. So Dan, uh, please the floor is yours. Let me just share my screen. Um, OK, can you see that? Yes, can see the slides and can see you and can hear you well, so please. Excellent stuff. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, it is AI for 6G, but um, I've titled it Research Requirements for End-to-End -end Network AI, because uh, I think that's where we're going to. and. Um, as we go through the slides, you'll see what I, I'm, I'm referring to. Um, this, uh, this first slide is a, is a slide taken from the Samsung corporate view on 6G, um, but it, it's also representative of everybody else's strategic vision around AI as we head towards 6G. So um, the, there's many different versions of this depending upon which vendor or which operator or which research institute you talk to, uh, but essentially it boils down to getting to a point where AI has some form of end-to-end um, -end and comprehensive nature, um, but it's made up of AI in different domains. So um, there's this concept of localized AI, uh, then joint AI running between different domains, and then ultimately moving towards end-to-end -to -end AI. And the presentations which have gone so far have been um, a mixture of that kind of localized AI and joint AI um, across application domain, core, radio, uh, some in UE, some federation between different domains. Uh, in the last presentation, a lot of the AI obviously moved towards the, the network edge to improve performance there. But 
that starting point that we have um, with with a localized implementation has associated with it um, kind of pre-built restrictions and, and those restrictions actually are running the risk of presenting it, preventing us from getting towards end-to-end uh, -to -end AI in the longer term. So what I wanted to talk about was the, the state, uh, uh, the, the current sort of state of the art, uh, what we're seeing actually implemented today in product, where the research directions are taking us, also where standards are going, uh, and some of the challenges that that presents. So here is where we are in terms of uh, implementation and you know, within a network node, network nodes are, are realistically, they are collections of network functions. So, you know, that, that, that runs true of standards. If you look into standardization, you'll, you'll have an acronym for a specific network element. And within that, there is individual pieces of functionality which are associated with that network node. Uh, and then if you translate that into a, a product implementation and you look at a product spec, the product spec is usually a long list of, it, of network functions as well, things which are which are taking place within that node based on inputs and resulting in outputs. And um, AI at the moment, as far as I can tell at least, is greatly being applied on an individual function basis. So, you know, it's it's uh, what I'd refer to at the bottom as hyper local. So, um, within a base station, for example, within a, within an E node B or a G node B. One function is identified as as having the potential to be optimized by artificial intelligence, and that artificial intelligence is applied on that function in isolation, um, and that optimizes that function. But but in some cases that has a detrimental impact on other functions within within the network node, and and that starts to become apparent when you look at the overall performance of the node um, as uh, as that implementation takes place. And increasingly, we're now starting to see conflict management being a requirement within network nodes where you may have multiple pieces of, of AI being applied and the AIs are actually working against each other. Um, so the, the best example that we've seen so far is, is applying artificial intelligence to turning components within, a, within a, a, a base station off. So that might be individual rats or different functional elements at points when, um, when load within that network node is low. Um, and on the other side, we, we've seen artificial intelligence applied to load balancing. So we, we ended up in a situation where you have one AI which is busily trying to empty one rat so, it could, so that the functional components could be turned off, and an AI on load balancing trying to balance users across all the rats that are available. And so users being pushed backwards and forwards by different um, competing AIs. Um, obviously, that's not good. So we, in that case, you need something which is overarching a network node layer, which is uh, mitigating between the two and determining who takes priority, what the overall uh, result of the, the application of artificial intelligence should be. Then you move on to look at standards. And you know, obviously at the moment, ORAN architecture is a, is a buzz topic in the industry. And you, you look at the way that ORAN is implemented in, and the split between uh, near real-time RIC and non-real-time RIC. And you have within those two domains, both the near real time and the non real time domain, you have the application of artificial intelligence to, to individual network nodes in the form of X apps and R apps. Um, and, and again, that, that's kind of starting to address some of the issues identified in the, the um, previous model where the, the functions which are actually providing the control within the network are separated out. And then the artificial intelligence is applied within the domain rather than directly into the network function. But, X apps and R apps, which are beginning to emerge, generally are optimizing on one thing, and that artificial intelligence again is being applied in a in a piecewise way. Although there is this kind of offboarding of the the capability from the the network node itself, uh, which then means that 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 mitigation between different artificial intelligences, um, which are trying to compete against each other, actually can be done in a in a separate way. But again, the point is that. This is still at a local layer. This is still RAN specific, um, rather than being something which is in in that direct end to end, uh, that full end to end view. And not only is it um, RAN specific, but it's kind of building into a silo. So whilst there is an interface between the near real time RIC and the non real time RIC, there isn't an interface from this out directly into the core or into a separate data plane associated with with the management of the rest of the network. So this is still at that local AI domain AI level, but it doesn't go out into the into the wider end to end uh, domain at this point. 
And then similarly, when you look at uh, release 1617 in particular, Core Network um, doesn't Core Network doesn't have AI explicitly called out as a function, but it ha does have the NW DAF identified within uh, SA2 specifications as a as a point where um, data is collected and analytics of some form takes place. What that analytics is, I don't think we will ever see defined within standards. Um, you know, to to a certain extent, the the NW DAF is a is a layer which sits in front of uh, intelligence which is behind, and the, and the intelligence is designed specifically within standards in such a way that it's left implementation um, independent. So, you know, what what we implement as Samsung may differ from what Miko is implementing as Nokia or anybody from Ericsson is implementing, and so on and so forth. The NW DAF is the point where data goes in and actions come out. But what is controlling those actions is left unidentified. Um, and then you move across and you look at the management domain. And in, in, in management, it's a similar situation with um, the MDAS producer and the MDAS consumer, where the MDAS is something which is making some form of data informed decisions um, within the management domain. But what is making those decisions and how it's making those decisions and reaching the conclusions it reaches and the actions that it then takes are left to be implementation dependent. So we're still kind of moving slowly out of the local AI domain towards joint AI, but it isn't really joint AI in the in the full kind of open um, data structure model that you might imagine. Um, it's still something which is relatively restricted. The interesting thing with 3GPP, there is an interface that runs from the uh, the NW DAF and the corn domain towards the MDAS. There isn't an interface that runs back. Um, and probably some point in the longer term, you would need to have full interactivity to start to move properly into that joint AI domain from, from the original slide. So then when you move on to think about what we're actually trying to do, we're, we're actually, like I say, putting in place um, a very dis domain oriented and function oriented implementation. The, the, um, the, the RICs are associated with the RAN, NWDAF associated with core, MDAF associated with management. And that means that whilst we can resolve conflicts which are taking place on a per node basis within this structure, you can't really resolve conflicts which might take place between the allocation of radio resource and an optimization in the radio and an optimization which takes place in the core. And indeed, you, you wouldn't have visibility of where an optimization in the radio actually causes a degradation in the core or vice versa. And, and so that, that kind of full end-to-end -end view ends up being almost impossible to reach with the direction that we've gone down in terms of early implementation and standards. We're, we're building in place now barriers to achieving what we're all saying we want to achieve as a 6G building block by having compre comprehensive AI um, as, a, as a goal for overall network optimization. So I think it's kind of obvious where we are now and where we want to go. We, we currently have this, this, uh, this model where we have these restrictions and these containers sitting around the outside of the implementation of artificial intelligence and, and XAPs and RAPs. What we actually need is some form of unified data structure and, and unified data plane, which then allows an AI plane to sit behind that, which includes the, the possibility for all of the different places where we're applying artificial intelligence to interact with each other and for there to be this conflict mitigation which which takes place. Now the, the thing about this is is that I I I kind of have first hand experience of some of the conflicts which are beginning to take place. And I also have increasing levels of um to a certain extent skepticism about what it is that we're actually going to be able to achieve. And, and so the, the next few slides talk about that in a little bit more um, detail at quite a high level, but, but still things that we need to be taking into account as we move forwards. Um, and, and these slides all have the same title. Is there any point to anything other than a full system view? So we know we want to move towards comprehensive AI. The question is, if is what we're doing now actually going to get us there or are we missing something out in in the view that we're taking so when you take into account an objective specific uh, optimization for example the optimization of throughput through a network function then we may be able to do that and apply ai and, and be very pleased with the results we may see a a 15 percent increase in throughput for example that uh, often i i use this example internally that the answer to everything with artificial intelligence seems to be 15 percent improvement um 
it always seems to be the benchmark that we end up at. Optimizing throughput by 15% within a network function is, is something which, you know, that there's application of artificial intelligence which has demonstrated this. On the other end of that, you may have another network function further down the line, which is trying to reduce power consumption. Um, and that would result in an improvement of 15% reduction in power consumption. Um, but you, you then kind of need to look at, well, if we combine these together, is it realistic to both optimize throughput and reduce power consumption? Because increasing throughput tends to have associated with it somewhere increased power consumption. Um, so, so when you put the two together, do you still get 15% improved throughput and 15% reduction in, in power consumption, or do you have to compromise somewhere between the two? And to work out if you want to compromise between the two, then you need to have this multi-KPI optimization option, which sits above and says, well, you can't, you can't have both. You need to kind of find the balance between optimization of one and optimization of the other. And you may get a little improvement in both, but you're not necessarily going to get maximum improvement across the two that you're looking at. And then you start to think about, well, we really, it's never going to be just two things that we're going to apply artificial intelligence to. It's a whole raft. And so that multi-KPI optimization then needs to be taking all of these into account and mitigating between all of them to get the optimization of the network function as a whole, which as you will no, if you've tried to do artificial intelligence in this way. First of all, it makes a very complicated goal structure. You know, if you're training against a, a reward model, the reward for something which has to mitigate multiple goals is very complicated to work out. And then you also need to have something which is striking the right balance between everything that you want to take into account in a, in a network function, which is already functioning in a fairly optimal way, just on the basis of um, compromises that everybody who actually implements network functions understands have to be put in place. And so this continues, right? You might have a specific a function specific versus an end-to-end -end model. And again, taking throughput optimization in network function one as the model, uh, you may be able to get 15% in the first network function, and you might be able to get 10% in the, the next network function along if you were to do that network function in isolation. And you might get 20% in the third network function where you're trying to optimize throughput. But the, the question then is, if you chain all of these together, what's the actual optimization that you get? If you take 15% in network function one, is there really another 10% available in network function two and another 20% available in network function three? Or, or does the 15% that you get in network function one remove all of the optimization potential in, in, in throughput in network function two and network function three as well? So, so what do you get? Do you get 45% because it's cumulative? Do you get 51.8%, which is kind of an, an exponential increase? So you not only do you get 15% in network function one, the 20% in, in network function two that you get as an optimization is actually also including 20% more of the 15%, which you got in network fu function one and so on upwards. Or do you only get 15% and, and you get zero in network function two and network function three? Or do you get nothing because it all cancels each other out and you end up back in status quo? Or do you actually degrade the uh, the overall throughput because you're overloading network function two and network function three as a result of the increased throughput that you get from network, network function one. Um, and, and so all of these options are on the table, but until you have something which is actually monitoring end-to-end -end network optimization and understanding the optimization methods that are available on a network function by network function basis, you don't know what the answer is. And I don't think we're at this point yet where you can actually consolidate all of the optimization on an end-to-end -end single function structure to understand what it is that you're, you're going to get out at the end of an end-to-end -end optimization, even if it's just around one KPI. And then you, uh, and then you move on to um, a function-specific versus domain-specific. So again, network function one is, is de delivering 15% uh, optimization uh, through AI on, uh, on throughput. But that potentially is 15% more across all of the functions that occupy the entire domain where network function one sits. And so then you've got to optimize load balancing, um, which is the second tier of what you're trying to do within that domain. And so whilst you're getting 15% more across everything, you may have no more load 
So actually that 15% gain is worth this because you're just going to send the same amount of traffic through each of the network functions because it's within the domain and load balancing then shares out the additional traffic and, and all the traffic which is there just passes through as it would have done regardless of what the, the optimal throughput may be. So once you've got that, those three perspectives, you then end up having to consolidate them. So you've got functions in, in, in the domain of network function one which are optimizing against multiple KPIs, multiple different elements within that network function. So the sub functions 1.1, 1.2, and so on down the list. You then have to optimize within that domain against all of the KPIs, which network function one is looking to, to optimize against. You then have to do the same in, in domain two, and you have to do the same in domain three. Um, and to do that, you've got to optimize everything within an end-to-end -end view. And, and until you get to that view, you don't actually know whether what you've got is a genuine improvement or not, or if what you're doing is degra degrading things at other points, whether it's removing the purpose of artificial intelligence applied in other network functions in other domains. You need that end-to-end -end view before you get to the point of actually being able to state categorically that what you're doing here is a full optimization. And all of this, you know, this is, this is a very top level model, but it doesn't take into account network slicing. It doesn't take into account service orchestration or or, um, or MANO. Uh, and it's only considering one network function per domain. So, you know, in a situation where you have RUDUC split, where you have the full explosion of SBA, you're, you're optimizing individual functions within all of those domains. And then all of those functions within that domain have to be optimized before you get to that end-to-end -end view as well. Um, and it's it's a little bit irksome because it appears from the outside that the cloud providers have got this nailed. So why do we find it hard and cloud providers find it easy? So here are the things which I think are the challenges that we need to take into account. And I, I was I kind of saw some of these coming through in the previous presentations as well. First one is definitely availability of data. Data availability, you know, large amounts of good quality data are really hard to come by, um, and that's for a bunch of good reasons. I also think there's a need for a metrology to understand and assess benefits. So, um, you know, particularly when uh, power consumption is a consideration and one of the KPIs that we're trying to address, there is power consumption associated with AI and training, machine learning. You know, GPUs are not particularly power efficient, so how do you measure the balance between the additional effort that's required to have a model that optimizes something and the resource that's required to get that model? Um, you need to take into account techniques for um, increased efficiency. And we saw some of, uh, I think there was some of that around sparse and pruned models. And we, we've done some work around that as well. And the agenda for achieving end-to-end -end AI ML, you need a unified data layer because data is, is key to all of this, but there's no point having specific domain data where you can only apply specific domain, domain artificial intelligence. It needs to be data which is available uh, at uh, in a plane across the entire network. You have to have the capability to chain applications and you have to have conflict mitigation in order to really fully understand what's taking place across the entire network. And you need to have, finally, you need to have a ref reflection and recognition of the experience that we have in networks already, um, because you know building a network is all about compromises. It's not about optimization of individual network functions or against individual KPIs. It's about the knowledge that, for example, you you can't have full cell capacity and full network coverage. You have to strike a balance between the two in the radio. You have to strike a balance. So, sorry, Dan, uh, how much time would you still need? 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me explain the picture. The, the, this is the last example about the need for human intelligence. The picture of the aircraft is a data set which was collected during World War II, and it was used as a model to decide where aircraft should be reinforced um, so that they would they would return back to back to bases during air raids um, and so analysis was done on aircraft that returned from air raids about where they'd been shot and so the determination was that you should strengthen all the places where all the red dots are now that's great except that actually what you need is to take into account a little bit of human intelligence on that if you received this data set and you applied it to artificial intelligence you get the result to strengthen the backs of the wings but the data set only comes from the survivors of air raids, not the planes that crash, because you don't get to see 
where the planes that have crashed have been shot. And the planes that have been crashed have been shot in the engines and around the cockpit. So it wasn't until the human in loop was applied into this to say, actually, it's the reverse. The goal is strengthen the bits where you don't see any uh, any bullet holes, because the bullet holes are the things that you can survive already. The places where you don't see bullet holes is the damage that you don't survive. Uh, and it's it's a well worked example. It's it's known as survivability bias. But the reason I include it here is to make that last point. We've got 30 years of building mobile networks under our belts, and we have a lot of very experienced people who understand the compromises that need to be made to make networks function. We shouldn't throw that away just by blind application of artificial intelligence. We need the results to be considered by the people who actually know how networks work to work out if they are the right kind of compromises and the right kind of end-to-end -end optimizations. That might have been slightly more than 30 seconds, but I'm done. Thank you very much, Mika. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so great stuff, uh, Dan. And uh, uh, there is a question in the chat, but I think that you already were, were touching that. And uh, so uh, in with this uh, time pressure, I, I would propose that, uh, uh, and also as there is no more questions there in the chat right away, I, I would propose that uh, we would uh, now have uh, like a just a couple of minute uh, break uh, before the next presentation. So if we start four minutes uh, past half an hour, so 34, so allow people uh, uh, to have a short break or go to fetch a cup of coffee or something like this. And uh, the next uh, presentation would be from Next C Alliance, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning by Otske Kaya. So let's start that at the uh, 34 minutes uh, past the hour. So thanks a lot uh, again, Dan. No problem, thank you. Okay, so uh, after the uh, short break, uh, so the floor would be yours, Etske.
so sorry, you are muted still. OK, I, I'm sharing my slide a second. No, no I can we can hear you, but uh, at least I don't see the slide. Yes, now they can be seen and now they are in a good format. So. Uh, yeah, uh, just just uh, you, your face is uh, quite at the upper part of the video, so it's a bit uh, cutting. Now it's much better. So so uh, now, now all is uh, set uh, at least uh, how, how it looks to me. So please ask. It. Um, no, is it is it good? Uh, can you see and hear me well? Yes, can okay. see you and can uh, see the slides and can hear you well. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so um, I'm Ozge Kaya. Uh, I am from Nokia Bell Labs. Uh, I'm located in uh, Murray Hill in New Jersey, in the US. Uh, today I will be talking uh, about uh, the Next G Alliance initiative uh, in US. Um, uh, in my uh, research, I am mostly looking to system level aspects of uh, ra radio systems, and uh, I'm look I'm applying a AI ML uh, uh, to radio systems research. Um, here, uh, I will focus uh, the next G Alliance, um, uh, this next G Alliance talks on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, Next G Alliance is an initiative uh, to advance North American uh, leadership in um, in virus technologies. So we focus on 5G evolutionary path and 6G development. Um, there are six working groups in Next G Alliance. Uh, those are applications, Green G, National uh, 6G roadmap. Societal and economic needs, spectrum, and technology. All these working groups uh, consist of people from industry, uh, academia, and government. Uh, there are not that many people from government, but they. Uh, I think the goal there is to incentivize uh, policies which would uh, have 6G technologies to flourish. These working groups. Uh, work on a six audacious goal. Um, 6G Alliance has uh, identified these 6G, uh, these six audacious goal uh, to prioritize uh, um, uh, contributions. I would like to go one over, uh, to one, over one through, uh, through each of them. I think they are uh, important and most of the work uh, in Next year Alliance is uh, on this uh, specific uh, goals. Uh, sustainability is about energy efficiency and environment. Um, the goal is to get to be carbon neutral by 2040. Um, here the goal is uh, to use the resources uh, if we, most efficiently um, while also protecting uh, the environment. Trust, security, and res uh, resilience uh, is about uh, having ne having networks which are fully trusted by people, businesses, uh, governments uh, to be resilient, secure, and privacy preserving. I think digital world experiences are going to create most economic value in the next uh, dec uh, uh, decade. Uh, it is um, it is more about multi-sensory experiences through 6G. We want to enhance human to human collaboration, and we want to enable also human machine 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 uh, uh, communication. And uh, we hope uh, to create new use cases and therefore economic value as well. 
um, cost efficiency is in, in the heart of 6G. So it is, it's, uh, it is essential uh, that we have affordable, accessible, and geographically uh, wide uh, sp uh, spread 6G networks uh, uh, and such services throughout uh, America. And I think that will help also um, uh, to reduce uh, the digital divide. Um, uh, distributed uh, cloud and communication systems uh, will be an enabler also for of digital world experiences. Uh, distributed cloud uh, communication systems uh, built on uh, virt uh, virtualization. Uh, uh, do you see my slides? I, I think someone shared something or? Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, so sorry, could you uh, share again? Okay. Okay, I think I was talking on distributed cloud and communication uh, that is about multi sensory, uh, uh, sorry, this. Um, distributed um, cloud and communication is about um, more uh, virtualization technologies. So with uh, virtualization, we want to increase fle flexibility and performance of uh, mixed reality, ultra LLC, uh, interactive uh, multi-sensory applications. Um, my, uh, my talk will be focusing on next J view on AI native virus networks. Um, so we want uh, uh, AI ML to enable breakthrough uh, 6G performance. So AI native virus networks are needed uh, to increase robustness, performance and efficiency uh, of uh, virus uh, networks and we expect these networks to address di uh, diverse traffic types, ultra dense deployments, and uh, much more challenging uh, spectrum uh, uh, stations. Um, so we uh, expect the uh, um, uh, next generation 6G standards uh, to be developed in AI native way. So AI will be entrenched in the design and development of 6G technologies. In 5G, it was like an overlay uh, with release 18. We have uh, uh, suggested some improvements where we can apply AI ML, but if we take an AI native approach, we can enable many more um, use cases and we may achieve much better um, performance uh, with uh, 6G networks. Um, for AI ML algorithms to work uh, in, uh, in, in network, we need both data sets, computing power, communication between interfaces, uh, storage of these data sets, uh, verification of them. Uh, but initially to uh, improve the research and development efforts related to AI ML, we may need to also to make uh, data sets available to academia and other research and development community to expedite the application of AI ML in networks. Um, we also uh, uh, think that operators will need to embrace AI as their new tool for increasing efficiency and quality of service. Um, so NextG Alliance puts strong emphasis on technology market readiness. So uh, we are focused on a full cycle of uh, research and development. Um, so that includes manufacturing, standardization, and um, market uh, readiness. So AI ML uh, won't be in 6G uh, uh, with uh, all capabilities from the beginning on. Uh, 
we envision that that will take steps. Uh, currently, if we look to research, most of the research is uh, focused on optimizing individual functions and models. For example, in the transmitter or receiver chain, you take uh, one uh, function and show you can do that with AIML and you show gains. The other approach is uh, optimizing multiple such models together and show that they are rep rep uh, they, they, they could be replaced by AIML. So um, the final goal is to achieve end-to-end -end application of AI, uh, AIML. Um, that would bring most benefits. I think if we can um, achieve that, we can also uh, have, uh, we can reduce the uh, gap between different standards. Um, we can maybe we can have 7G uh, in a much shorter time frame than we had, uh, than we transitioned from uh, 5G to 6G. Uh, so we are expecting the initial application of AI ML by 2025. So further advanced applications like end-to-end -end AI will be in 2030 and beyond. Um, so AI ML opens um, large uh, many uh, use cases and uh, markets. And if we combine with uh, if we can combine that with 6G, uh, we can solve big problems and uh, uh, make uh, that uh, useful to people's lives. Uh, consider the ability to sense the environment. If we can couple that with uh, AI, ML and um, data collection, we can come up with uh, ambient intelligence. And based on that, we can have uh, new applications that would create new markets. Uh, so uh, so uh, if we look what we can uh, solve with AI ML as, uh, right now um, we are doing what we have done before. Uh, uh, previously without AI ML, we were showing that we can come up with optimum algorithms, but they were they would be MP hard or very complex. Then we were proposing suboptimal algorithms which wouldn't perform that well. But the AIML we can close this complexity gap. Uh, we can come very close to optimal solutions uh, with uh, much less compl uh, complexity, and we can tackle problems where even we don't have any models. We can. Uh, we can come uh, come up come up uh, with solutions uh, even without need of understanding the problem or scenario. Uh, we can apply AI ML to all li uh, layers of communication systems. At five layer, the goal would be end-to-end -end optimization. Uh, we can let's say uh, use. Um, replicate uh, channel coding by AI, AI ML. We can have better uh, digital play distortion, receiver processing. Uh, in Mac layer, um, AI ML can be applied to learn new signaling protocols and um, we can uh, ef effectively, ef effectively apply our algorithms to uh, different uh, diverse traffic uh, models. In network and operation layer, if we can collect um, uh, rich data, we can solve uh, many uh, problems which are relative to networks like load balancing, energy saving optimizations, interference met uh, management, spectrum sharing, um, uh, coordination of uh, different bands, handover optimizations, um, and antenna tuning. AI can provide also security services like user authentication, access, control, anom anomaly detection, and attack detection. Uh, all of these uh, requires us to address uh, major technology challenges. Um, in if we look to the computer vision like uh, use cases, you can have your data model uh, inference function at the same location. 
but uh, in wireless to build the 6G uh, intelligence, we need to approach the problem in a distributed way. Um, so in 6G, all system elements, UE space stations, networks will be uh, parts of a distributed network. So we expect um, each, uh, each of them, UE space station uh, network, to run some form of AI ML processing or data collection, storage, and communication with different layers. Uh, I said AI ML will come in stages. First, we will uh, replace some functionalities, but that is a very tough task. Once we replace the function in the network with AI ML, we need to make sure that it is interoperable. If we need this to make changes in the all, uh, other algorithms, that function still needs to work. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, input and output is adequately defined. Um, so an AI ML algorithm is as good as your data is. Um, so if your data is not rich enough and you deployed uh, that algorithm without uh, extensive testing, you may face uh, performance issues. Then we would need fallback uh, mechanisms. Um, those could be um, using uh, simplified models, which we which you trust more to work, or you we can just fall back to uh, conventional algorithms. Data sets are very important uh, both to generate uh, new models and advanced AI ML applications, but we need to be also careful there. We need to be able to verify our data. We need to make sure that it, uh, it was not uh, prone to uh, data poisoning attacks, um, and we need to make sure that data could be stored and accessed uh, efficiently and privacy uh, reserving manner. Uh, computational uh, complexity is very important if you want to uh, realize your algorithm in a product. Current chips have limits um, the, and you, you, they need to run many AI ML algorithms simultaneously. Therefore, we need to have a, an adequate size of AI, um, uh, adequate size of models. Um, so we may have much better performance with uh, with a large med, uh, model, uh, but let's say by reducing the number of convolutional layers, we can reduce latency, or by reducing the number of dense layers, we can reduce size. So there are trade-offs in uh, realizing uh, the algorithms and products. On top of that, uh, we may show very large gains uh, with floating point models, but once we quantize, we will give up uh, um, many performance benefits. So therefore, realistic assessments uh, of AI ML algorithms also are also a key. Um, to collect the data, uh, we will need new functionalities in the network. Um, since all system elements are distributed, we will need to um, we will need to transfer data and model with, uh, within the network. All of this requ will require uh, overhead. We will need to uh, address uh, the overhead uh, related uh, to AIML in 6G uh, networks. Uh, of course, uh, we need to have policy controls and uh, monitoring capabilities. Um, so NextG Alliance envisions uh, the future 6G system uh, to be designed in an AI native way. Uh, so AI will be incorporated in, the, in major functionality from very beginning of system design and development uh, cycle. Um, and it will disrupt the way we design, implement, and optimize next generation wireless communication systems uh, in also in 6G and beyond. Um, we expect AI native to increase robustness, performance, and efficiencies, uh, um, and uh, that will bring uh, enormous uh, economic impact. Uh, thank you.
topics and topics. Thanks a lot, Edske. So uh, great uh, material. Uh, there is uh, quite a challenging question in the chat uh, about how would you compare US uh, uh, vision uh, with the earlier presented European and uh, Chinese uh, views. Uh, so, so at least there is uh, quite some similarities, but uh, do, do you have some immediate answer to this? Um, yes, uh, I think uh, the, the technology is universal. Uh, we each, uh, each of us, we are trying to uh, have our leadership um, in areas uh, which matter to us. Uh, but uh, if you think uh, Europe and uh, uh, North America have also different needs and characteristics. Europe is uh, in Europe people. Uh, uh, mostly live in dense cities, but in US uh, we have diverse uh, set of use cases. There are areas where the coverage important. There are areas where the user density is a problem, and uh, uh, still uh, there will be some differences in the networks. Also, spectrum is not the same in in, in every country. So uh, especially below six uh, gigahertz, uh, each country has different fragmentation of spectrum and they need to uh, use them uh, uh, in a most uh, efficient way uh, while coexisting with, uh, with other parties. Um, uh, yes, uh, also uh, if you look from the economic perspective, uh, each country have uh, different incentives to uh, invest uh, into 6G. In some countries, they are uh, much more government backup. In some countries, it is more private sector uh, 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 driven. All of these are uh, will cause um, differences how we approach and solve the problem. Yeah, thank you. So the discussion could uh, continue uh, then in the chat. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, I, I think it's uh, time for us to move forward. Uh, so then it would be time to hear about the native AI network. So uh, Mero and Depa, uh, please. Hi. Hi. So let me just see if I can update, uh, I can upload my, my slides. Yes. Okay, you see my slides? Yes, I can see and hear you well. Okay, very good. So it's going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to do like a 15 minutes or 18 minutes talk. So we have questions afterwards. First of all, thank you for the invitation. So my name is Mirwan Deba and I'm Chief Research Officer at the, the Te Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. Uh, which is a kind of uh, Fraunhofer for Institute that we're building at the moment, uh, quite uh, working on various topics. And of course, uh, uh, 6G is is uh, one big uh, topic or corresponding to that. And the purpose of my talk is about, of course, to talk uh, on the session about how I see things related to native AI networks and where basically uh, the biggest leap uh, for 6G since the 6G session would be related to AI. So uh, if we go around basically what you, we know as what we call G waves, we've been going, as you all know, within this 10 year time frame of a different generation. And uh, uh, we could summarize things in this following manner. I mean, if you go for 2G, uh, the, the KPI uh, of, of 2G was mostly about mobile for voice. If you go uh, on 3G, we're lo mostly looking for mobile for data. And I think a lot of you know the history behind the, uh, 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 the 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 big the big hurdles that we get went through uh, 3G, and then 2010 uh, we're talking about mobile for in internet, and now 5G came in with the m deployments that we're seeing now, which uh, unfortunately at the moment are not still tailored for mobile for things, but this is exactly what we're running in uh, the next years. It's mostly today, mostly uh, around the MBB, but roughly the idea is still to go mobile for things. And now uh, I think there's a bit of a consensus that uh, one of the 6G vision that everybody has is to drive something related to mobile for intelligence, meaning basically uh, connecting intelligence and basically creating a network on which we can uh, basically move intelligence from one point to the other point of the network and, and in some way create the kind of network which would enable that. 
Now, of course, the big question that everybody's asking uh, today is how to build a network that connects intelligence. Uh, and of course, uh, AI is certainly a part, a big part of that in the sense that, of course, uh, the fact that today, when you look at the model or the initial model of Shannon, where you had an information source, a transmitter, uh, a, a channel and a receiver destination, well, there was something missing and the kind of, of things which were missing was basically the, the computing capability and I would say the large data storage which is available. In the classical sense of the communication of Shannon, as you all know, whenever you transmit a message, then you don't store the past. And we know that when you start storing the past in various parts of the network within this convergence of what we call uh, computing and communication, then basically you can create some kind of context in your communication. What I mean by context, I mean basically like we humans, when we start communicating, well, basically uh, we know what happened in the past and whenever you restart the communication, well, there is some legacy that you can exploit basically in your communication because you have created some models. And the fact that you can create a context, of course, changes the paradigm in terms of how you communicate. And this is how we humans, we, we communicate in the sense that the more data you send, the, next, you, the less you need to send data in the next I would say kind of phase of your communication because you build a context with that person. Today, of course, there is a tendency to go in trying to define that kind of uh, connectivity with intelligence through a notion called semantic network. I'm not still sure that this is the right way to go. However, we know that basically AI will be a big uh, way of leveraging and how you connect intelligence. Now, uh, if we go around the specific t type of AI that we're talking of to, as of today, I think there's two issues that we're looking at. One of the issues, and it was mentioned, uh, is basically that AI has two ways of building the, the network. Either you use intelligence or AI for improving the connectivity, or you start building a connectivity to make basically AI happen in a pervasive manner. My point of view here is to say that uh, I think the big part that we're talking today about uh, AI for connectivity can already be used as of today and be uh, used also in the improvements of the 5G networks that are build, being built already. We don't necessarily need to have 6G for that in the sense that uh, we can already deploy basically AI. We can deploy basically the kind of, 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 of computing that is in different parts of the network and exploit basically the kind of different signaling formats that we have as of today to be, be able to improve the intelligence. And this goes back, of course, to already a kind of, 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 of paper of Shannon, uh, which was quite known called Programming a Computer for Playing Chess, on which the idea, of course, that uh, in the future, we will have those machines which are capable of doing many things and for which basically AI will be improving a lot of things in terms of how we design systems. And in that paper, if you have time to read it, I strongly encourage you. It was asked to Shannon what he thought would be the future after his uh, two landmarks paper of 1948. And you can see here, the big things that he was mentioning was about machines for designing filters and equalizers, which is exactly what's happening today where people are using basically uh, AI to improve basically the physical layer by doing better basically kind of uh, precoders, doing better types of receiver structures. Machine for designing relay and circuits, switching circuits, all the routing basically pr protocols that we're seeing, also AI is now having an impact. And you can see all the different steps going up to what we call machines for capable of logical detection. Now, of course, you can ask me why uh, Shannon had wrote, written that in the, his 1950 paper and it only took time now to happen. I think you know all the story behind basically the big winters that went through AI and why now it's so successful with this uh, fruitful combination of three things, which is the first one being the computing power, which is available. The second one, which is basically the data that we're able to capture. And the third one is the sophisticatedness or let's say how sophisticated we're in uh, creating some new kind of machine learning algorithm and DNN being one of them. And of course, the kind of things that can already be deployed as of today, and I think uh, 
will also continue in the evolutions of 5G and have nothing to do with 6G is about basically improving all the things that we already know and on which basically many of the presenters before were trying to, to capture on. And basically that was the whole end-to-end -end scenario where because it's hard to have models which capture basically the cross-layer kind of design, then of course you can replace everything with an end-to-end -end perspective. And here you have much more specific, I would say, kind of applications on which we're seeing already some interesting progress, but they have also nothing to do with 6G in the sense that uh, we're talking about more systems that, we're de we're, that we have been deploying and on which basically we can use the huge amount of, of basically data that we're having to improve the system going, as you can see, from very low level type of things like LT, 4G, 5G, uh, power control, PAPR, nonlinear compensation, to things which are more about end-to-end -end performance learning. And also with the huge uh, vari variations in terms of how you apply these machine learning algorithm, going from regression clustering classification to things which are much more advanced, going to deep learning, uh, reinforcement deep learning, transfer learning and graphical algorithms. And there, of course, um, the kind of, of things that we can do uh, is quite astonishing, especially on the transfer learning part, where we're seeing operators deploying basically networks in one part of a of a city and being able to create models out of that and transfer those models to not retrain the whole system when they do a deployment elsewhere in a different region of the country or even in another country by restarting basically the kind of training, not with random initialization of the parameters of basically the neural network, but by just the parameters that we optimize in the other network and for which exploit some kind of similarities in terms of behavior of the users and you go on like that. And I think this is also gonna be going, but it's not gonna be the big drastic, I would say kind of, 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 of blowing mindset that you can think about building a 6G. I think that part which is more interesting for us uh, as basically uh, people are constructing networks is what are we, why are we doing it that? Well, we're doing it that because basically we want to be, to have AI performing much better than it can today. And by building basically this massive distributed computer that everybody's imagining and giving basically the vision that uh, uh, von Neumann had started with building a computer where basically when he started von Neumann in 1948, he built a computer where you had a very distinction between basically what we call the computing units and basically the, the storage unit. And as you know, uh, today we know that uh, uh, the big issue that we have is not anymore about moving the data, but it's about moving the computing. And if you want to move the computing at a very fast rate, then you need to build a network for which the computing will move faster. And we know today that there's many reasons why it's not anymore, uh, I would say, obvious or even interesting to move data within the network because of privacy reasons, because of latency reasons, because of coverage reasons, and for which what you want to change as a mindset is to move more or less the computing units where the data is and extract from this kind of models, and it's those models that move around your network. And those models, of course, that you're trying to pour and how you leverage, of course, goes within a notion that you want to connect intelligence and you want to move intelligence from one point to the other point and for which we don't have. Of course, the idea of going beyond the Shannon point of view of data, but going into more the meaning that you extract, meaning what kind of information you extract from the data is also, also part of a of quite famous paper of Shannon and basically done with Weaver, and in which he defined basically different levels of communication. Level A was about how accurately can the symbols of communication be transmitted, and this is what opened the door around the whole Shannon uh, information theory kind of framework, and in which we built also coding scheme. And then came also the idea of looking at level B type of communication, which is exactly what I was explaining before in terms of looking not anymore at the data per se, raw data, but the kind of extraction that you do from that data when you start conveying the meaning. And of course, when you start computing at the edge, you start extracting some meaning from your data to move it elsewhere, and in which basically you start building some kind of context by having this uh, leveraging this different data. Now, of course, this kind of research is already going on, and we're seeing a lot of uh, different parts of universities trying to work on the whole field of semantic communication with a lot of uh, deep neural network behind to be able to extract the kind of things and also building some kind of semantic codes uh, to be able, of course, to write the coding scheme, which enables you to do the whole stuff that I'm seeing here. 
Now, of course, the big question, which is still unanswered and for which there's still work to do, is basically how do we build a common understanding? Because if you want to move intelligence, well, you need to create some kind of common in in understanding. And with also the idea I told you about, which I think if we would be able to make it happen, would be the big, I would say, kind of advancements that we would get from 6G and which would be the requirements in terms of basically the specification that you need at the physical layer to be able to leverage all the uh, massive intelligence that you have. And here, of course, the kind of work that is being done goes into more sophisticated ideas in terms of uh, the more you communicate, the less you need to talk in the sense that by building a certain context at one moment, you build the models in different parts of the world and and different parts of the network. And those models basically enable you to compress easier your data in terms of what you transmit because you can reconstruct because you had a past experience and you know the kind of contextual information uh, that you had uh, within your communication. Now, of course, this is possible as of today because of the large amount of possibilities that we have within the supervisive AI setting. And as you know, we have many fat manufacturers today which are building the, the capability of having a pervasive AI network, which is not any more cloud-based, it's not necessarily edge-based, and for which basically, depending on the kind of scenario, we start to leverage basically the different parts of the network with, of course, the latency requirements, the kind of, of computing requirements and the kind of power. Of course, for, for us as uh, basically communication researchers, uh, doing device, for example, edge is extremely interesting, not necessarily just in terms of uh, building a better network, but also in terms of improving how AI is being done. And the way, for example, just to give you an example, if you start doing uh, uh, device on uh, or the or a, a edge AI or on device AI, then you cannot run typically the classical type of DNN you would imagine. And there's a simple reason for that. Just I've been working a couple of years on that. Uh, If you start basically looking at the complexity that you have, then the type of resolution your neural networks start to decrease. Otherwise, you have immediately some kind of complexity issues that you need to tackle. Take an IoT, for example, if you want to run an AI on that. And one of the reasons is that if you go now to precision, which gets lower, and doing some kind of low precision AI on the device because of the complexity that you have, then you cannot do any more some kind of training mechanism on that. And there's a simple reason is that training by itself is related to optimization. Okay, that's the the initial step. And optimization is related to, of course, doing some kind of gradient. And in fact, in in the terminology that is often used by machine learning experts, we're talking about stochastic gradient descent. Doing a stochastic gradient descent or a gradient means you do derivative. And if you do derivative, basically, and that's at the heart of optimization, then basically it's impossible to do it when you have a precision which goes low up to what we call a binary neural network. Okay. And if you need to redesign an architecture, typically, which is related to doing some kind of training on an IoT or a device, then basically you need to rechange the whole way the way things are done, which is what obviously people would do in the classical machine learning uh, community. And if you start building something which is called a binary neural network because of the precision, what's interesting about that, then you can reuse all the kind of expertise that people have been doing in communication. Because optimization, when you have only zero and ones, because the weights can only take values which are zero and ones, corresponds to combinatorial optimization. And I think uh, uh, you are all part of that community uh, whenever you depart basically from the problem of, of, of uh, detection or you go into the problem of detection, then doing basically combinatorial optimization requests you to look at all the maximum likelihood. And we know that we're all good in that, in the sense that uh, doing basically some combinatorial optimization, the gates are quite open in terms of doing a lot of heuristics to how to optimize. And I've been working a, a couple of years on these kind of new structures that you have for the device. And it's quite interesting because we've been using a lot of the typical algorithms that you have with the Viterbi algorithms and others to be able to reconstruct a BNN or binary neural network kind of structure, which is based on these uh, optimization techniques, which are reminiscent of what we do in general in decoding. For example, when you start doing a decoder, this is just to give you a bit of hint. But here, I think in terms of uh, the native AI networks, on top of basically being able to do the computing in a certain way to extract basically the meaning out of your data, which is basically the model and you leverage, what is very important for us as of today is to understand basically 
Well, what are the kind of latency requirements are, which are requested in the next generation 6G network so that we can do inference typically at a very fast rate? How can we build a, I would say, a massive distributed computer on which not the data moves anymore, but it's basically the models or basically the, the computing uh, which moves around the network? And this is what I call here building a unified training and inference network and for which basically the standardization process will have an impact in terms of defining, of course, the interfaces that we're looking at around here. I think this is much more important for us within the construction of the next generation, basically kind of standard, rather than using basically AI for building connectivity. The fact that we want to use connectivity for improving AI is the right way to go in terms of a, a big leap in what we're doing and for which standardization, from my point of view, will have a work to be done. Now, of course, when you look at this uh, uh, kind of framework, the gates are also quite open and I think you're quite familiar as of today, of various, I would say, communities of researchers trying to develop already the kind of distributed algorithms which enable uh, this vision that I'm talking about. And of course, one of the big hype today, which is going on, is around what we call federated learning and massive federated learning by trying to leverage basically uh, the massiveness of the local data and trying to do a massive data a perspective out of a massive number of small data by trying to transit in a certain way the different kind of, of, of models that you capture. And there also the gates are quite open in terms of architectures that can be built because you can either basically, of course, move the model from one device to the other device by loops and improving on top of that, or you start clustering. And I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done in having a full understanding of what is the right architecture which can scale with also the kind of 6G requirements that we need to put in, in terms of latency, so that we can get the result as soon as possible. And this is something already in computers that we're trying to construct, where we have in-memory processing. This is already an issue for us. I think I finished my talk to give you basically the, the kind of, of global vision, with I would say a more pessimistic, I would say, point of view in using AI for connectivity for 6G, where I think the biggest uh, usage will be already now in terms of its evolution of 5G in terms of usage, and where I see a big opportunity for basically 6G by being, I would say, the, the, clean clay, the clean slate kind of architecture that will enable basically AI or pervasive AI or intelligence to capture all its potential. Thanks a lot, uh, Meruan, for great uh, insights, uh, uh, so profound uh, views uh, in this uh, area. Uh, at the moment, uh, we we have actually one question in the chat, uh, and uh, uh, we, we are also a bit uh, tight with the time, but uh, maybe we can take a quick uh, look at that. Uh, so there is that uh, uh, the uh, Miltos is uh, wondering which other hardships to envision in the terms of specifying standardizing semantic based uh, communications. So that's a very good question. Uh, I, I've been, in fact, in a workshop these two days around semantic communications with people from different parts of the world. One of the first things that was already a big issue was defining semantic communications by itself, or what we call semantic information. And this is already not done at the moment, but let's put this apart in the sense that you need a strict definition of what is semantic, because even the community, people would talk about more things like which, what they call goal-oriented communication uh, and, and things. But uh, things are going on in that direction and it's okay. The, the, the thing about specifying the standardization is of course, uh, uh, what would semantic communication be useful for? Well, the idea is of course, is that uh, it will be more reliable in terms of communicating your data. It will also basically uh, reduce uh, the kind of latency and uh, low rates that you need to get the result done. And the question, of course, is to specify the interfaces on which you will start building the model. This is still not clear yet on um, how we will be able to do it. Uh, it's still basically at, at the start. And the workshop that we did the last two days was already trying to mention, why don't we start already looking at implementing semantic communication in the actual Wi-Fi or 5G scenario to understand what are the limitations that we're having already with the protocol stack in implementing that, so that then we can specify to the people who have been defining the KPIs of 6G, that if you want to connect intelligence, this is the kind of 
KPIs that you need to set, which are related to the to be able to transit and infer quite rapidly. Thanks again, uh, Meruan. So let's uh, continue the chat um, uh, or the, the questions and answers in the chat as needed. And uh, let's uh, then uh, move uh, uh, forward uh, and uh, ask uh, Daemon uh, project uh, to present uh, learning to predict for automated network management. So it would be Alan Cole, so floor is uh, yours. Yeah, good morning. So, uh, Alan, uh, we could uh, see you joining, but uh, then the connection bit uh, froze. I don't know if you can still hear us. Oh. Okay, now. No. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. So, would you share your slides or? Okay, you can see my. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. No. Uh, at least no. I can't. I don't know if others can. No, oh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, so we should be fine. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm I'm Alan Korea from the India Network uh, so, Institute sorry, sorry, in Madrid. Uh, at, at least I can't yet see the slides. Oh, you cannot? Okay. Not yet. Uh, uh, Okay. We can now see, I think, your screen. Now we can see, at least I can see your slides. Uh, uh, so please. Okay. So, yeah. And unfortunately, uh, the slides disappeared, so they were there. Now they are there again. Okay. <laughs> uh, I will start. Just yeah. let me know if. They disappeared again. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm Alan Kore from the MDA Network Institute from Madrid, and I will present the learning to predict for automated network management within the Demon project. So let's start with introduce uh, the subject. So with network management, what is actually done in with in today network management? So it's becoming more and more complex, uh, and we need to adapt uh, every. I mean, we need to adapt to every problem and to take uh, because it's becoming more and more complex and more and more. So we need some to take some anticipatory actions. Within this uh, new distributed infrastructure and every day there is new. Paradigms and new use fields, so yeah, but currently uh, there is. No way to do so and. The only thing we are doing is to optimize some generic uh, and manually or manually designed objective, and this uh, this not fulfill the uh, the promised goal actually. And uh, is there a solution for this? So yeah, this is uh, towards a zero touch approach, which is basically the intent based networking, so or IBN. So what is highest? All level of uh, network management today. It's uh, basically adapting the network only using some high level human and stable uh, directives or intents uh, that must be translated uh, automatically by the predictor, uh, by the predictor, sorry, by the network management entities and into with uh, into a machine language, uh, more machine language, uh, language, uh, yeah, machine level language, and then this will be implemented within the network. So for example, just uh, say to the uh, this network management entities, I want to ensure the high reliability to all the Twitch traffic streaming for a fusion area in Philadelphia in the next hour. And that's it. That's, I mean, the network itself will automatically convert this uh, intense, these directives into a machine level language, and it will uh, also adapt it itself uh, within the network but it's i mean it's impossible to define models to solve uh, each possible exact task for example the, this this 
is of course not the same than providing the uh, enough traffic, enough, uh, I don't know, Facebook traffic in uh, whole New Zealand for the next week, for example. Uh, also, this cannot automatic. I mean, this cannot uh, be adapted to not known a priori uh, uh, metrics. For example, using some quality of experience from end users, uh, because this quality of experience is linked to some network KPIs in very complex ways, and even these KPIs are dependent in for, to the resource allocation in a also very complex way. So it's what we are targeting. So let's say first, there is a need of improvement for this. I mean, this is a tweet from François Cholet, so it's the creator of Keras, the library Keras in the Python, mm -hmm. uh, where it says, it gen in general, there is no simple relationship between what you optimize for, so the training loss in the neural network, and what you care about, so the test metrics. Even validation loss is a terrible proxy. The model with the best accuracy or precision recall is like usually not the one with the best validation loss. Okay, this is really classification oriented, but it's also work and it's also the case for regression problem and forecasting problems. So this is what is actually done. There is two different ways. So first, very with the first method is to train our neural networks with some legacy loss functions such as mean square error, mean absolute error, pinball loss, whatever. But this is actually quite bad. This, uh, this uh, has very poor performances because it's not adapted to such goals. I mean, for example, if I want to, because it's only forecasting the traffic and not, for example, the capacity, and there will be some description, I mean, some traffic description, and we do not want that, of course. Uh, we can also add a decision block at the end. So let's say, Okay, after after forecasting uh, the true traffic, I want to add or to multiply this traffic by a certain amount, and it should be fine. But in fact, it's not, it doesn't work. And also it's very dependent on the task. And the other approach is to manually design loss function. So it's basically unmade uh, loss function, uh, what are, which are fitted to the model, which are very dependent also uh, from the task we want to target. And it needs also some huge efforts to tune, to tune these uh, parameters, because if you create your loss function, this loss function will have some parameters that you have to tune. And these parameters, these hyper parameters, will be very dependent of the data set of the predictor and basically of all your model. And also there is a huge problem, it's because you need a differentiable loss. And this is also not a very simple things to do. So what we are proposing, so it's a loss learning predictor or loss sleep approach. So basically we are using a loss learning block, which is in fact another neural network that is trained to, feel, to fit a metric with in order to reduce this mismatch between the loss, the loss function and the actual metric we want to target. And the results of this loss learning block is actually used as the loss of the predictor, I mean, to train the predictor. So with this, we do, we simply need, it doesn't need to be branchable or even continuous. So it's a big step, uh, you, I mean, compared to what is actually done. It also adapts itself to any kind of data set or any kind of predictor without external tuning. And it can shape some multi-dimensional uh, loss function. So, I mean, because actual standard loss function are only in one dimension. It's just a function of the difference between the true value and the predicted value. With this, we can have four, five, six dimension, whatever. I will explain, of course, everything. So this is, for example, the metrics we can obtain with uh, our method. So we can obtain some very complex method. The first one, the most, the leftmost graph, is showing a, uh, yeah, a loss function which is made uh, using some quality of experience, which is not possible uh, with actual method. Uh, in the middle, we can see also some multidimensional. In fact, here it's a three-dimensional shape in a 4D space. Of course, uh, I can I couldn't. Uh, Plot the four-dimensional thing, so I have, I have colors and everything. And at the rightmost, it's uh, it's also a 
to show that we are not using a continuous metric. The metric is in fact the black lines and the results, the resulting loss is uh, orange dots basically in the thing. So yeah, the metric doesn't have to be continuous. So now let's go deeper into the loss learning predictor architecture. So this is basically this. Okay, it's maybe a bit uh, complex, but I will explain everything, of course. This is mainly composed of three parts. So there is the first the predictor, then there is the loss learning block. We, I mean, as I said, it's uh, what we are comparing to a standard loss function. And this role and everything. So first the predictor, what is the predictor? So it just works as a standard predictor. It's, uh, we are mostly using a recurrent neural network because we are targeting mostly forecasting problems, but it can be of any architecture, convolutional neural network, multi-layer perception, whatever. Uh, we are using for these standard hyperparameters and we are just adding one input. So it's a noise input that I will explain. And you know, to for the training, so, we are sorry, using uh, one, one request. If you could uh, switch off your video, that might improve the audio quality because there seems to be a bit of bandwidth problem. Okay. Uh, okay, we go. Okay. Yep. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, slides are visible and audio is coming. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, as I was saying, there is one additional input, so the noise input, and we are using some cyclic learning rate. So it's just a method in order to adapt the learning rate during the training. Uh, then there is the loss learning block. So it it's just a multi-layer perception. And it's, this is what's trying to fit the metric of the model. So as I said, it's what is the loss function of the predictor basically but with a differentiable expression because it's a neural network and i suppose and polynomial are different by nature uh, so it gives more flexibility than a simple loss function because it can also be in multi uh, multiple dimension not only one or two uh, there is however only one condition on the metric, but which is very simple to fulfill. It's just that it has to be the best at its minimum. So even if it's not the case, we can arrange easily the metric to be the best at its minimum. And uh, there is, we can also add some external inputs. So for example, some KPIs or some system metrics uh, at, as input of this loss learning block in order to, to make the model even more accurate. And the, the output of this loss learning block is basically used for the predictor backpropagation. So we are using the output as the as the loss obtained from a loss a standard loss function. Okay, now the added noise. So the added noise is basically inspired inspired from the reinforcement learning, and it tries to imitate this exploration exploitation dilemma uh, because we want to. I mean to enlarge a bit our output in order to shape in a better way the loss function obtained with the loss learning block. So it's as it uh, is it an input of the it's an input of the predictor and it's also added to the output of the predictor. And then it's uh, its impact will reduce which will reduce over time because it's an input of the predictor and then the predictor will learn with the training to add uh, this uh, epsilon so this noise um, to the output value and then it will reduce uh, the, its impact of course it's only used for training and it for testing purposes it's uh, set to zero uh, also a big advantage of this noise it's because when it's combined to the cyclic learning rate and the nature of the loss learning block so a very complex polynomials it reduces change, it reduces chances, not avoiding them, but reduces a lot to diverge or to be stuck in local minima because the gradient can never be zero and it also cannot be an extreme value. So now this is the global architecture. Uh, of course, because everything is working together, it's not three different parts. It's really everything is working together with a simple backpropagation with, uh, within, 
the training. And now let's let's go to to a use case. So it's the goal of this is to maximize the incomes uh, according to the quality of experience users. So this is of course the full the full pipeline. It's not only a simple objective function as in absolute error. So this is the input. So it's the traffic, the actual true traffic and the capacity we are targeting. Uh, then this is a complex uh, pipeline where there is an empirical model for the QoE using the probability distribution uh, among the traffic and the users. And then this, uh, this QoE is discretized into a non-continuous function, a stepwise function. And then the output is the combination of this and the cost of the capacity. Um, to the capacity. And this is the metric actually we are using to train our model. And this is the result. So uh, in the in the left, it's the same uh, graph as before, and it's the resulting loss function we obtain at the end of training. And this is a very complex one. This is not uh, doable by human, I will say. Uh, I mean, maybe it is, but in a very complex, using very complex uh, mathematical things, and actually this is without any tuning or anything. And in the right, this is uh, our the results we are obtaining in terms of cost, uh, comparing comparing it to uh, an actual uh, state of the art. So deep cog, it's a state of the art. It's the red bars. Our model is the blue bar, and Oracle, it's basically the perfect model. It's a model where we know the, the output. So our model, so the loss learning predictor, is way better than the actual state of the art and it's way closer to the perfect case, I will say. And especially, we do not need any human tuning. I mean, we do not need any tuning, whereas deep cog, it's, it's required. So yeah. for attention. Do you have any question? Sorry. Thank you, Alan. Uh, uh, any Alan. questions, comments? There is uh, a question in the chat. Uh, how do you see quality of experience models for 6G when we even don't know only uh, groups of use cases? S uh, sorry, I didn't. C can you see the chat? Uh, I don't know if there is a connectivity problem. Hope uh, myself I'm clearly visible. But maybe for the question, then we need to come back uh, in the chat uh, uh, based on the available connectivity. And uh, uh, I would then uh, propose that we move forward to the last uh, presentation of the session. So Dedicat 6C Data Marketplace for Access Control, Asset Sharing and Privacy Preserving AI ML by George uh, Saleh. So George, please. Hi everyone, so no delays. Let me just try to share my screen. Help everybody. Jones, yes. You can be heard and uh, the slides can be seen. So please move forward. Thank you. Thank you. So hi everyone. I will walk you through a, a bit of the secure data marketplace and what we are doing in, um, in the project dedicated 6G uh, for the different use cases. But first I would say uh, who needs a secure data marketplace and what are I would say the use cases underneath that can be covered. So mainly the, the secured marketplace is there for the access control for if you want to do any secure data exchanges, any transactions, uh, data monetization, how you can apply analytics on top of the data since you are exchanging data, how you can apply analytics on top of these data in a secure way. Uh, also with having the uh, in the mind the privacy preserving uh, of these data, of these raw data. So for us, this is, I would say, the role of the, of the marketplace. Not only that, that the marketplace should be able also 
to be agnostic to data and should be also bring the automation and time efficiency in the processes and the procedures. Now, the fact that we see the marketplace with an underlying, I would say, technology such as blockchains, where we can take advantage of different features, especially the security features, not, not only, but the smart contracting also. Uh, these are being used to have the agreements between the different parties, so the providers and the consumers of the data or the services. Uh, since the marketplace would be agnostic to the data, then you can, in fact, at the end of the day, you can share services, algorithms, execution of algorithms on top of the data for AI ML. So all these actions and transactions are, I would say, traced in an immutable database, which will be, in that case, the blockchain. For the smart contracting, we see, I would say, more and more use cases coming in, especially between agreements. Access control is, at the end of the day, a smart contract. And of course, the conditional transactions that are also monitored by the smart contract themselves. So if we go through a marketplace, a secured marketplace in that case, we have a, a data provider or a service provider that will publish that in the in the marketplace. It should appear in the catalog. And again, the catalog itself will have different levels of access control and policies that are managed by smart contracts. Uh, so it can be at a, an organization level and it can be at the service level itself. Once it is in the catalog, I would say, the consumer then can come browse the catalog and again depending on the consumer permissions that he has he will be able to see different services or different data and again this can be completely machine to machine through apis once you i would say one you want to access that specific data set or service you will uh, request the access if you are granted then you will get that access and of course if it's a monetization behind the scenes you can buy that access and the transaction itself is managed also by the blockchain in that case now the thing that we are i would say exchanging data between different uh, users from or the data sets can be different providers as we, as we saw uh, and uh, in the previous uh, presentations especially when we talk about federated machine learning, meaning that you want to apply your algorithm on different sources. In that case, you need to have the permissions from these different sources, not only instead of moving the data between the different sources back to a centralized DB. The idea is here in the marketplace is that you bring the algorithm back to the data. So in fact, you will run the algorithm in a federated way and you will give only the insights to the data consumer or to the to the machine in that case if it's a machine to machine so just here different use cases for example iot data monetization and exchange so we we see that uh, more and more i would say even in the 6g world there will be more and more use cases and more and more elements that are exchanging data and services to access these services in fact you will have the marketplace that will enable you the permissions there that will enable you the access control and the federated machine learning on top of these data now the data can be still on the edge from the architecture that we are i would say studying is that you can run i would say the algorithms on the edge or the data can be exchanged between two different uh, i would say iot elements directly through the marketplace through the smart contracting and I would say the, the secured exchange peer-to-peer. -peer. And here is, I would say, another another use case that we, we see, it's between different cities. So in fact, the marketplaces themselves can be at the city level or they can be at the globals between the different cities. So a city can have its own marketplace for uh, data I would say exchange and data sharing and the exchange between the different city can happen also through the say through a global marketplace and applying the AI ML uh, in that case if the federated I would say and privacy preserving is needed again we will use the orchestration from the marketplace where you will be able to provide the algorithm that will be ran on the different uh, data sources and getting again one insight from these data at the, at the same time
And the fact, I would say again, the fact that we have this blockchain, uh, and of course we are talking about a private permission blockchain, not a public blockchain in that case, uh, the fact that we have these uh, blockchains will enable us also to have, if needed, the monetization through a smart contract through the marketplace it, itself. So just, I would say, yeah, about uh, the, the AI, initiative or the AI orchestration in the marketplace. So first, the marketplace is being used to access, to be granted access to the data. Once you have this permission and this grant to access the different data sources from the marketplace itself, you will have the algorithm or the data scientist that will provide you with that algorithm. And this combination is ran through the marketplace, orchestrated by the marketplace himself to be run on the different sources and again giving back to the data scientist in that case the insight from that execution and creating a new model for example for having more accuracy in the models as we mentioned we need more data sources and in that case you can run in a federated way in a federated approach the algorithms on top of these data through the marketplace with the control of the marketplace the advantage here is that you have all the traceability and all the readability which is immutable because it's done through the, the blockchain. You can know when the algorithm was run, which data sources were used and so on. So in, in, in our case, in the, in the 6G, I would say world, what we are trying to, to address the different challenges in that case is how the data can be exchanged in the, in the 6G world with a new I would say approaches with different use cases and how also not only the data but also the access to these I would say compute component how to access to the edge infrastructure through a marketplace because again we are agnostic to the data so in fact a data point can be also in that case a compute component and we give you the access to that compute component or to that portion of the 6G uh, uh, compute that is available or bandwidth that is available. So we are working on different, I would say, use cases, uh, smart highways, uh, user experience, and smart warehousing in different, I would say, domains, and trying to see where uh, the marketplace will, I would say, the implementation of the federated machine learning will enhance the user experience, and also the fact that there is a, the private permission blockchain also will give us more a trust in the data exchange, more trust in the sources and uh, pro data providers and of course uh, opening the the, the the approaches opening this to a data monetization and data incentive behind, behind that that can be done also through that deployments and that should be it for me if there are any questions? Thank you, George. Uh, so at least immediately there is not a question in the chat, but let's still wait for a moment. Now there is a question, what is the alternative solution to using blockchain? So, uh, uh, right now, I would say probably the blockchain can be used, is used as a commodity, as a part of the solution. Uh, if we want to remove the, uh, the blockchain, we will need to have a way where we need to recreate, I would say, kind of immutable databases where we can also host the smart contracting because the smart contracts are, at the end of the day, piece of code that is in, in that are saved and stored in the inside the blockchain so it will be probably i would say question of trust and having this immutability between the participant in the, in that kind of marketplaces so, so, so if i might add uh, Drashko is Drashko is speaking also from nokia working together with george on a dedicated 6g so removing the blockchain is you know uh, feasible but then you will have to re-implement a lot of uh, things that are coming off the shelf with blockchains let's say one of the 
very important features uh, that we were looking at is the optional monetization. So when we talk about the monetization and digitalization of money in general, uh, blockchain is really, really good and really safe. So implementing your own digital money is kind of difficult task, you know, even for the banks. Uh, so this way, um, uh, uh, when you are digital, uh, when you digitalize, you know, the, the, the way the payments for data are going, you, uh, you get a few uh, very nice features. For example, uh, uh, the, through those smart contracts that George mentioned, the revenue sharing is done automatically in the platform itself, and it's re relatively trivial uh, a smart contract. Then, for example, um, when you have digital money, um, you can envision machine-to-machine -machine economy where, uh, you know, the fraction of a cent uh, uh, can be paid, uh, let's say, uh, for entering some door or, or, or some, some things like this. So we needed uh, also, you know, to automate and digitalize those payments to have a, a very, um, let's say, a very small, very small amount of payments without uh, banking fees or something like this. And so in that in that case, you know, it's it's obvious that blockchain is very interesting. But beyond this, beyond you know payments and and so on, uh, distributing trust between uh, different organization, let's say in a kind of uh, uh, a supply supply chain or or service uh, sharing mode in where where you know the the different vendors and different providers of technologies and services come together, um, and they would like to. Uh, let's say you have a platform uh, th through which they can say there is a trust that not one single um, uh, organization can go and change the internal database and change you know some uh, rules uh, not to mention you know banking accounts but let's say the rules agreed upon which a service will be shared or metrics that will uh, tell us the quality of service and so on or even the, the auditing logs that are uh, that needs to be mutable for the kind of a, a dispute uh, purposes and so on and so there is there is a, this need for one database that that everybody can trust uh, uh, and then it's very difficult to to achieve this without uh, let's say a, a kind of byzantine fault tolerance and uh, this kind of uh, distribution that blockchains offer so it's it is possible it's not impossible but but having all those nice features uh, that i mentioned i think that blockchain fits very nice into the this kind of data exchange and so on so not to forget some other just let's say i will mention just one more feature that we leverage upon a lot it's for data integrity we are for every data that you know like uh, is exchanged or is you know shared or access control is shared we also are storing uh, um, uh, hashes of uh, you know either a data set or a, or a, or, a, or a, some let's say a paper contract for the quality of service and so on so we have this hashing of the certain data for the notary purposes and this kind of integrity uh, data integrity guarantees are also something that are that is feature of distributed uh, ledger technologies that we are leveraging upon so a lot of i would say features uh, that exist today and that we would have to re-implement uh, our on on our own if we didn't use the blockchain miko i cannot hear you i think maybe you are on mute so. Yeah, sorry. So thank you, Drasko. Thank you, George. Uh, there is uh, no further uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, we are roughly at the uh, scheduled uh, ending time. So we were able to finish in time because the two last presentations were slightly shorter than the reserved time. So Thanks again uh, to all for joining. Uh, thanks uh, for the active discussion. Thanks a lot uh, for all the presentations. And um, as um, already communicated, so uh, 
slides that will be made available by the presenters. Uh, they will be available from uh, HexaX uh, website, as well as there will be a link to uh, the HexaX YouTube channel with uh, video, video material as well. And uh, uh, for, for future events, uh, please uh, stay tuned uh, with the uh, HexaX website, uh, follow the other projects, and uh, also HexaX has uh, Twitter, Twitter and LinkedIn accounts uh, on which you can find information via our website, for example. Uh, uh, so, um, has been a pleasure. I think that uh, we have certainly been able to share lots of uh, mutually useful, useful information, uh, helping us to move towards uh, one global 60 standard. Um, and uh, uh, thank you also for the positive uh, comments in the chat. Uh, if you have any other Further comments, suggestions, uh, also you can use, uh, uh, for example, then uh, my email address that you can find from the HexaX uh, website. Um, so, uh, any burning comments uh, still? OK, so then it's uh, time to close the uh, last of these uh, four sessions. Once again, uh, thank you and uh, let's uh, continue the interaction. Uh, uh, pay attention to Hexa X and other ICT52 projects and uh, looking forward to being in touch with you again. So thanks. Goodbye. Thank you, Mikko and Oli. Bye bye. Good weekend. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.